about to start. We're, we're just um, halfway through item 10, in fact, or maybe not even halfway through. We've had the update from Craig McElroy and Andrew Chin from Healthy Waters and Water Care. Um, we, we now have another um, double presentation from Ross Roberts, Head of Engineering Resilience, and, and Paul Kleinack, General Manager of Resilient Land and, and Coast, to, to cover those particular parts of the, of the Auckland region and, and the flood event and the response and the cyclone. So, uh, Paul, are you going to lead off in this one? So, Ross, in fact, is. I think we've got everyone sitting down now. So, uh, welcome, Ross. Away you go. Uh, Kira, Kira Roberts, Aho. And what I'll do today is uh, briefly talk you through some of the landslide issues we've got around the region. And, and the, the focus will really be on showing you the various different impacts that have been experienced. Uh, my team's been in emergency response for the past two weeks. And so this is, this is really a first pass for you to give you an idea of the spread of the impacts and the different types of impacts that we've experienced. And, so this is the uh, our first example from the North Shore uh, near Narrow Neck. And what we've got here is a collapse of a cliff. And this is a, a useful example to share because it is private land. So this is a cliff that is privately owned. Uh, you can see um, the garden at the top with a, a fence hanging over. Uh, but what's most relevant here is that it has buried a stormwater outfall. So even where there is private land um, that has failed, it can affect council assets. And a lot of council assets have been affected in this way, and it causes us quite a lot of challenge um, with working out the, uh, the best way to remediate these. In this particular case, uh, we believe that our asset is probably still functioning satisfactorily, and so we're satisfied that nothing needs to be done urgently. Uh, moving over towards Birkenhead, Inkster Street, this is a, a classic example which represents many that we've seen where private land has been affected. Um, our team is working very closely with regulatory services, going around doing the placarding process, um, putting the red, yellow, or white placards on buildings to uh, say how they can safely be used. And that's a, a huge exercise which is continuing across Auckland and has uh, only grown uh, since the recent cyclone went through. Based on what we've seen so far, we believe there have been several thousand landslides in the Auckland region. And um, in the first event, um, in the order of about 300 uh, residential properties directly affected, it may be getting towards 1,000 now. Um, this is another example from the, uh, the Birkenhead area, just showing a, uh, a path, a council path, which has been um, completely destroyed and shows that there are lots of small assets like this, which will be very, very challenging to reinstate, and the, uh, the costs associated with amalgamated across the region could be extremely extensive. Uh, I've thrown this one in. This is um, taken from a helicopter on the Saturday after the first rainstorm. And you can see that the um, landslides in the rural parts of Auckland are very extensive. And this is part of the reason why we have such high numbers. Um, but of course, where there are no direct impacts or relatively minimal direct impacts, it's of less importance to council. So when I talk about numbers being in the uh, the ten, you know, several thousands, um, we need to take that with a bit of a pinch of salt. What really matters to us is the ones that are impacting on the people of Auckland or the assets of Auckland Council. Uh, and to that, here's an example of uh, another one which is um, somewhere west of Walkworth that has taken out an entire slope. It's also uh, completely inundated a road and the main trunk line leading north from Auckland. Uh, so the railway is um, uh, completely destroyed, the road is completely inundated, and this is the sort of landslide that will take a very significant period of time to resolve, because that is uh, still on the move and will continue to be for some time. There's a lot of material in there to remove before those roads and that railway can be used again. Uh, moving down to our coastal cliffs again, uh, we have a lot of properties close to coastal cliffs. These are some examples from the Manico Harbour, uh, and you can see how recent slips are uh, covering quite extensive parts of our um, cliff line. In most cases, they're very shallow, so the cliffs haven't retreated far, uh, but they have still retreated far enough to have quite an impact on many of the properties at the crest. Um, a bit like this one, where you can see that uh, what used to be quite a nice garden is now uh, severely. This is um, on the northern shore of the Manukau Harbour. Uh, 
so this house, of course, has uh, been assessed by the rapid building assessment process, uh, and the, uh, the damage is uh, going to be somewhat challenging to remediate for that one. It's not always by the coastline, though. So this is uh, just inshore um, near French Bay, and you can see there are quite a few landslides like this one uh, in that area where um, slips have come down on the steep slopes in that terrain, uh, damaged the properties at the top, damaged roads or properties at the bottom, and so there are lots of compounding, conflicting um, demands in those because there is a lot of landowners involved uh, and quite a lot of properties affected. Going back further north, this is near Puhoi, um, and this is looking at uh, the impact on council assets. This is uh, one that you might want to consider for um, the impact it has on the uh, linkages across the region. So you can see a few small landslides in this slide. Um, if you look at the nearest bend, there's a few. Uh, if you look in mid-shot, there's a bigger slide that has cracked the road quite badly. But further back, you can see there are other cracks all the way around. And in reality, we expect that that whole slope is unstable. Uh, and that road is similar in some ways to SH25A in the Coromandel in that it will be a, a very significant effort to reinstate it. Um, before we go on to the um, coastal side of this, I'm going to uh, just skip over to something more recent, which wasn't able to be put into the uh, presentation directly because it's uh, new from yesterday. Uh, and that's some of our information from Murawai, where I've spent the, the last few days. So what you can see here is uh, drone footage taken yesterday of some of the locations there. Uh, you can see that we've got a very steep cliff at the back of the uh, site, which has failed in multiple locations and has caused serious damage to the houses at the tow. We've got a whole load of tow, uh, tow houses there um, running all the way along the cliff line, and there's been some very significant impacts on them all. The damage is uh, extremely extensive. It covers um, much of the cliff line, uh, so it's going to be a very significant process to um, review what's happened there to identify which houses are at risk, and I'm going back out there this afternoon to talk to the local residents about the, the next steps. We're um, partway through the placarding process at the moment, uh, and it's going to take a little while to finish that. Once that is finished, there's a much bigger piece of work that's going to follow, looking at which parts of Murawai um, can be successfully restored, and what other options we have for the areas where we think the risk is just too high. Right, from that I'll uh, pass back to Paul. Uh, if you could restart the slides, please. Good everybody, Paul, Paul Klonek, Toko Ingwa. Um, I'm the General Manager of the Resilient Land and Coast Department. I, I want to give um, elected representatives a, a bit of an appreciation in respect of some of the coastal damage that's also been sustained as part of this wider storm event. Um, the storm damage can be attributed to both events, so the flooding event which had an impact upon our coast, anywhere where we had a natural watercourse discharge, and obviously through Cyclone Gabrielle, um, more impacts related to storm surge um, and coastal erosion. So a quick bit of context for Cyclone Gabrielle from a coastal perspective. Um, swell of around 10 metres recorded offshore of Marsden, of some wave boys that they have up there. Um, we were fortunate in some respects that we had a reasonably low tide, so it was a three metre tide, um, but because of the low pressure system and storm surge components, um, a realised water level of around 4.2 metres. So just to give a bit of context, uh, from a king tide perspective, and, and you'll all be aware of when we have king tides, they're usually around 3.6 metres. It's those tides which inundate and can flood some of our roadings, some of our infrastructure, some of our esplanade reserves. So this was quite uh, unique in respect of the water levels, uh, the swell that was actually realised at the coast. And obviously, um, when you look at some of the imagery, I want to share um, some of the resulting impacts. So. I want to focus a little bit on Oriwa, and I'm going to I'm going to move back to Murray's Bay. But again, these are only indicative of the sort of damage that we're observing, um, that we're, we're tracking currently. And the team at the moment is moving around the southeast coast of Auckland, and, and over the next uh, week or two, we'll move to the offshore islands as well, expecting that we might find 
um, some damage in and around Waiheke and obviously Aotea, a great barrier. So uh, the image you can see here, a good example of, of a small watercourse um, at Kinloch Reserve turning into quite a large watercourse during the flooding event and then being impacted uh, by some of that coastal energy wave attack. Um, it's removed the footbridge, scaled out um, an area of reserve there, so quite a, quite a decent loss of public land in that space, and obviously access has been compromised. Um, you can see some of the infrastructure has been damaged there as well. That's a water line discharging to the right of the image. Um, if we move a little further north in Oriwa, um, between Marine View and Kohu Street, um, some of the elected members will be aware this is we were proposing to build um, a seawall in this location. Um, what you can see there is loss of material that used to exist over some of the debris that you can see in place. That used to be Esplanade Reserve, and what we've lost uh, to date is land or Esplanade Reserve, public open space, back to the private property boundary. Um, obviously, issues um, in respect of erosion that exposes debris, um, bits of concrete and rebar. So there's a, there's a plan of action at the moment when debris like that's exposed to work with our parks community facilities and their contractors to remove some of that debris. If we move a little south, um, this is an image that's getting quite a bit of uh, media coverage at the moment. This is Oriva Reserve. Again, a, a pretty stark example of uh, the effects of coastal erosion in and around that part of the reserve. Um, we have a line of Norfolk pines that were planted there um, historically um, along the dune crest. Um, and what we're finding is it's becoming increasingly difficult uh, to manage the coastal fringe in this location with the trees being set so far forward. Uh, there is a plan uh, to manage that part of the beach with uh, sand replenishment, regular sand replenishment. Um, and today there is sand being transferred to that location you cannot see those roots anymore, so sand's been um, reinstated, pushed back in there. Uh, our arborists, who you can see in the distance here in that photo, are quite confident that the roots, uh, the trees remain stable in their current position and the sand buffer will uh, remain a good management response for the foreseeable future. Um, Murray's Bay, just my last image, um, uh, indicative of the sort of um, seawalls that we're finding have been overtopped um, with inadequate drainage um, scoured at the base or the foundation, rotating forward and failing. Um, there is quite a lot of work to be done in this space, renewal, repair, rebuild. Um, but importantly, in instances like this, our focus remains not just on the uh, make safe and exclude people from a safety perspective, but making sure that we understand what critical infrastructure um, resides in this area as well. So what you can't quite see in this image is a wastewater line that runs in behind the bank that's been scoured. So it's likely that in instances like this along our coast, there might be a two-stage approach of some uh, urgent emergency works or buffering of the coast, and that might be via provision of geotextile and rock uh, before we come back in and rebuild, um, likely to be a structure in a location like that under our renewals work program. With that, I'll pass back to Ross. Thank you, Paul. So, uh, this slide is uh, used to explain some of the things that we're doing to understand the extent of the damage. Um, one of the key things that we're trying to do is ensure that we uh, have a very detailed understanding of what's going on across the region, because it is very hard sometimes to get the big picture for these. So we have uh, a project underway at the moment to um, scan our entire coastline using LIDAR. I'll put a little bit of an explanation up there. Um, it's effectively a laser scanning technique, which creates a very accurate 3D model. Uh, and we're using that um, to give us a baseline to understand the erosion rates so that we can inform future planning decisions about where things should be built and where they shouldn't be built based on really robust science. Fortunately, with this particular project, we collected the full data set uh, and finished about two days before the storm hit. Uh, and we're now using the same provider to uh, repeat some of the areas so that we can get a good understanding of what the change has been directly as a result of that storm and use that to inform our decision making in the future. Uh, we're also collecting uh, satellite imagery um, from after the events and getting access to interim satellite, satellite imagery from between the events so we get a really good understanding of where the landslides are across the region and we're working closely with GNS Science and with the, uh, the New Zealand Landslides Database to make sure that we have really robust data sets that can inform uh, our risk assessments and our planning decisions as well as where we put our assets and what's at risk. And, and Perhaps not least, probably most importantly, we have a, a large team of staff out on site uh, going around assessing these sites, supporting people who've been affected and trying to understand exactly what needs to be done to do remedial works or to support those other people who 
uh, doing remedial works privately. There's going to be a lot of long-term thinking that needs to come out of this. We are very much in the emergency response stage and dealing with the tragic circumstances that have hit people across the region, and I'm thinking particularly in Mirawai, where my team is today. The things that we need to start thinking about in the long term, though, um, renewal of damage structures. Uh, there has been a lot of damage, uh, and we need to think carefully about how we renew those in a way that makes them resilient and robust, and whether renewal is the right decision in each case. So we need to be sure, careful that we don't um, jump in with a quick response without thinking it through carefully. Um, I've talked a little bit about data. Um, this is a fantastic learning opportunity for us, and that might be the, the one silver lining that we see to this. There is a lot of information that we can get from this, and it's very important that we don't miss the opportunity to learn the lessons from this and to build that into our thinking in the future. And there will be plenty of unknowns. So there's a lot for us to think about, uh, and a lot of work that still needs to go. We are very much in the early stages of this. Uh, so you'll expect plenty more updates from us as we go through this process. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ross and Paul. And, and as you said, un unfortunately, a number of those images are pretty typical uh, of large parts of, of Auckland. Uh, you know, they, they are typical examples now. Um, I've got some waste slides, but Paul. Uh, okay, do, do we yeah, want to show them now? Yeah. After Paul and after the finish. Yeah, okay, great. So, so yeah, so these, um, the visual imaging here is, is really quite striking. So um, I'll open up for questions to, to Ross and Paul. Yes, uh, Councillor Walker. Uh, uh, obviously, I've got a, a high degree of familiarity with uh, the Hibiscus Coast in various areas. And in a number of circumstances, you've got stormwater from the roading network that's going over coastal cliffs onto the cliff area and loading it up. So I'm just bringing to your attention that there are aspects of stormwater that have got issues. And as we covered off earlier, part of the issue around that is you've got walking transport that is, that is involved with one part. You've got healthy waters that's involved with another part. And then you've got coastal processes and, and, and so on. And how are we going to deal with that interface so that the, the problem is dealt with in its totality? Because people in the community see it, and quite often they've raised these issues and they find that it just gets pushed from one part to another. Thank you. Go to Councillor Walker. Through, through the chair, um, I won't go into too much detail today, but, but I would make reference to some of the work that's currently underway from a, from a coastal management perspective in respect to the shoreline adaptation plans that Council's preparing. Um, it's timely that we're bringing another plan back to um, committee in March for approval. And I've asked the team to speak a little bit more to not only the plan for approval, but reference to um, some of the short-term uh, impacts of storm events, how that factors into some of our longer-term considerations for climate change, and importantly, um, how we better leverage really good relationships and collaboration across the council family that the SAPs help um, pull together. So uh, within that piece of work, for example, we have Auckland Transport, um, Watercare, um, the CTOs, various departments of council are all interwoven in our approach and our reference to um, short, medium, longer term management uh, options that we can we can look to adopt. So we will spend a little bit more time going into that detail based on your question when we come back in March. I'd also like to um, make reference to some of the work um, that we do within my department as well, um, guidance documents, technical standards. So we are undertaking a review at the moment around um, what we have, what we might need and what might need to be changed. Again, that's another vehicle to bring the council family um, together, and, and, and the council family is collaborating currently in that space. But I think recent events are really helping us focus on the, the need to adjust, refocus, pivot in this space. So um, quite a bit of work afoot. And again, you'll hear me and the team and Ross speak a little bit more when we come back to committee in March. Uh, just one other related example, and again, it just goes to that uh, general coastline. 
We've got a circumstance in many instances throughout the Hibiscus Coast where all the outfalls are below mean high water springs. The consequence when we had an onshore event is that a number of those outfalls, Manly, for example, was totally blocked. Um, again, it goes to the interaction between um, healthy waters, coastal and the like. I mean, I was in a position where I was on the ground and noticed that. So I was able to get hold of an engineer or get some information to an engineer so that it was dealt with. Because in this instance, in a number of coastal areas, we actually dodged a bullet. If there had have been a worse event in terms of rainfall and, as you pointed out, higher tides, and normally that's the case, in a number of situations there would have been inundation of areas. So my question just goes to the preparedness around the interconnection so that you've got people on the ground that are aware of where these hotspots are, which can be identified so that they're being attended to. Any response around that, Paul? Through the Chair. Um, in addition to, well, it, it, I think my response previously has captured a little bit of how we're thinking about addressing interconnectivity of disciplines for the SAPs. Um, there's probably a little bit more work happening in that space um, than some of the elected members might be aware of. So again, we will bring back a comprehensive update as to how we're meshing uh, the various considerations that need to be um, worked through. Um, these are the things that speak to some of the recommendations we make around whether we hold the line, whether we look to retreat and naturalise over time, um, or whether we are reliant upon infrastructure or, or more uh, towards a, a naturalised approach where working in with nature. Um, again, the issues that are raised, and, and they are they are very important issues. They are well known. I think it's the challenge of, of how we we work together to map the best way forward. Um, you, you heard Ross speak to um, the fact that this event is enabling us to capture a lot of data, um, a lot of observation. And I think um, there's an opportunity here while it's fresh in the community's minds, having experienced back to back quite extreme uh, storm events to, to help lead a conversation around communities' expectations as well. Um, what we can do within our, um, our, our portfolios currently to make better some of what's been discussed, but importantly, mapping out what the future needs to look like um, to get us there. So it, it is a great question. It is something that we're, we are considering. It is something the council family is collaborating on. Um, I think it's just the task for us is to bring that back um, to have a bit more of a focused discussion in that space and importantly to map out scenarios or scenario testing as to what some of those options actually look like on the ground. Thank you, Paul, and it's certainly something we're going to have to be spending a lot more time with in this committee. Mia Brown. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Ross and I had the benefit of walking along Afitu, staring at cliffs and some rather hopeful coastal um, protection works uh, and we agreed from a geological point of view what we were st staring at and I really tell Toka what both of you are doing. This is an opportunity for a broad education of public in a not simplistic but in a simplified understandable way about some messages. We, a lot of coastal stuff has been self-funded and, and that falls into the hopeful uh, bracket, like the block wall that fell over in one of your pictures. And there are some things we learn that do work and some don't. And, and nothing is a guarantee if you're going to be on the coast. But um, penetrable structures like stone gabions work a lot better than block walls do. Hard fixed things don't, just don't work. So we can, if we are going to, people will want us to do some of their own work. At least we can guide them away from dumb stuff that actually looks good but doesn't work. Um, the ground movement is no respecter of boundaries. Um, and uh, we need to remind people with some simple messages that cliffs grow backwards. You will never have more land if you're on a cliff. Your view will improve until you're part of it. Um, so some simple do's and don'ts 
and and along with what we had before, uh, something that sea cleaners that I'm involved in do is stop putting rubbish into our system. Um, that's from the two guys before you, but in your ones, I, it sounds to me like you're heading towards some simple rules. We will have some. It's it's going to be hard to determine where we do and don't get on top of a cliff. The further you go back, the safer you get. Um, but exactly, is there a point at which you become safe? No, it's not really. Um, and fraught with this difficulties, we will be finding us under a lot of legal challenge. The, the wealthy people on the cliffs will lawyer up to try and blame us for giving them building consents. We need to be aware of that as an issue too. So I very much thank you for your stuff. It's going to, there's more to come out of this and more steps to come from what you're doing. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I thought we'd take that by, by way of a comment and feedback. So thanks very much, Ross and Paul, um, for that update and look forward to seeing a bit more of you as the year progresses. Before we go to the Auckland Transport uh, representatives, we've got a, a quick update from Parole uh, with respect of the, the waste uh, response and, and consequences of the, the storm and the cyclone. Welcome, Parole. I better switch that on. Thank you so much for having us here because waste sometimes gets forgotten in the infrastructure conversation. But I think waste is a big part of what happens when an event like this strikes a city. And I just want to reflect on how we have responded to what has come our way, but also to just reflect on what does the waste infrastructure deal with. So we focused on mainly the residential elements of what we faced as a part of this event. But the waste infrastructure actually dealt with the flooded retail shops, the supermarkets that got, got flooded, all the material that came from those flooded uh, shops and supermarkets had to go somewhere. So the infrastructure that when we talk about waste and what, what is the infrastructure that sits behind it is it starts on your curbside with your trucks, which picks it up. It then takes it to a facility, which are normally transfer stations. From there, it bulk, bulk hauls to a landfill. At those facilities, it also tends to try and recover what we can from it. We have been able to collect materials such as whiteware and being very mindful of what you might have in your fridge and having to degas those elements at those transfer stations. So health and safety is of primary concern for us when we deal with waste. So I just want to take you through a few slides, which just give you a bit of a flavor in terms of what the team has been doing over the last three weeks, pretty much. Um, so we set up initially a self-help in terms of going from 1 to 15 transfer stations region-wide to actually have uh, residents take their material to for free. Now, just bearing that in mind that these facilities are not owned and operated by council. We have the Waitakere facility that we own and operate. We have community recycling centres that form part of this network, which we are really grateful to have. Others are owned and operated by the private sector. And they, we were grateful for them to come on board with us to actually establish those facilities for residents to take their material for free. We also have the call center called the number that we set up to actually uh, for people to call and request and request a service. And this was related to whether we could help them get the material out of the homes or what it is for to pick up from the curbside. So that was put in play. It was a joint effort, as I said, with the private waste companies. Initially, we went with the ones we knew and the ones that we've been working with. But the size of the problem was so large that we had to innovate and look at who else can we bring, bring into the fold. We had three deconstruction companies that brought in their fleet. And I'll show you some photographs of some trucks which I have never dealt with before. They're massive and they have grab arms on them. But that is what was needed to actually clear up the city. While we were trying to deal with the flood waste, the cyclone was coming. And I guess the mandate there was try and get it off the street as soon as possible. So the team has, uh, my entire team was deployed to do this work while we continued our curbside collections. We could not forget that the bins still needed to be collected off the curbside. And that is a service we provide weekly and fortnightly in the entire region. We definitely needed extra person power to do this because you can have a truck but you cannot have the driver going all the time, and you cannot have the people collecting off the curb going all the time. We were limited and are still limited by driver hours, but also fatigue. 
for people who are picking up heavy material off the curb and putting it in the truck. So I guess just in numbers, um, reflecting on what we were dealing with, over 3,000 requests for service. Uh, in terms of context, waste does get a lot of requests for service. I think we deal to about 120,000 a year, but this was on top of it. So we had to deal with uh, a large number of requests for service coming through. We managed to put out approximately 850 bins, skip bins and flexi bags out there. We started a bit slow, but then they ramped up pretty quick. In some situations, we actually gave the bin out and then we had to empty it about three, four times. So they saw a lot of bins that were used. We could not get to each and every um, part of the city quick enough, but that was because of what resources we had and what people we could put in the mix. As I said, we pulled in more contractors. So by the end of it, we had 10 contractors out there in the city picking from the curb. This was made up of our own waste companies, but also the deconstruction companies, as I said, but also the community organizations that are part of the, the network. Any truck, anybody who could drive it, and of course, yes, health and safety was the main concern, made sure that was all done, and we pulled them in to actually clear a lot of streets. Some streets, I know, we've gone over and over again. I think one number was eight times. So as we picked up the material, more came out, uh, but the teams have been going at it since then. We've seen a number of customers come through our facilities as well. These are customers or loads, uh, but I think one weekend, the Wi-Fi transportation actually saw one, a customer a minute. So that's a really fast flowing event in terms of that facility. And the idea was to take the material off and get the customer back on the road as soon as possible. We did see a little bit of frustration in the community because there were long queues at these facilities as people were trying to get rid of their material. So this is just a graphic to give you an idea of where the request for service came from. The bits in red obviously give you an idea that was the, those were the hotspots. And I'm sure you all are very aware of what's happened in your communities. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for giving us the intel that sat within your communities as well. It helped the team to prioritize as well. We had people monitoring the areas, but sometimes we just can't be everywhere. So a big thank you to the elected members for giving us the intel. This is just a photograph of the different type of trucks that we've actually utilized. So you can see a massive truck on the top, uh, which is from a deconstruction company. And there are others that have got the grab arms on them. We found very quickly that some material we can get people to pick and load. The other bits are easier done by a grab arm. To, mo to mobilize this fleet, we needed to get the health and safety aspects of them done really quickly to ensure there were no accidents on the road and we were doing a really safe operation. These are still out in, uh, in the field at the moment, uh, trying to get rid of the bits that are left now. So I talked about calling for additional uh, person power. Very, very important. And a big thank you to the the Defense Force for actually having their personnel with us doing this, uh, because otherwise we wouldn't have got through the piles that we had. One of the photographs that shows you an aerial view, which we took from the helicopter together with the Defense Force, where you could see our trucks actually collecting the piles as they were doing it. This just gives you a pictorial view of the trust stations or the facilities that we have got that are providing that service for free now for people affected by the cyclone as well. And it is a bit of a, it is a good spread in terms of the region, uh, which is there to cater for communities that, so that people can reach these uh, facilities quick enough. And in this graph, we can also see that Waitakri actually received quite a big chunk of the material uh, that we are working with at the moment. So I guess having that facility as part of our infrastructure is quite good because we were able to mobilize it quite quickly and also able to respond to any issues that come through, like being able to um, degas bridges and the white way that we've been collecting. Just my last slide reflecting on the piles. Uh, it's always good to have a picture of rubbish in the background. That's the uh, tipping floor of Waitakere, and you can see it has been quite high over the last few days. But we've also had the uh, Defense Force officials helping us through that facility. And I just also want to uh, talk a little bit about the community recycling centers and the role that they have played 
in the network. Uh, some of them have taken material as it has come. They are taking material from the curbside, missed curbside collection days as well. But there are also hubs for the community where donated goods are coming into. And they are able to give that back into their communities. So while they have a role to play in waste, they actually have a role to play in resource recovery as well. So as a network, I feel we have done quite well in terms of what's come at us. We were fortunate that none of the facilities were actually massively damaged by the floods and the landfills were all open and accessible. We've had to extend times at those facilities, but otherwise the infrastructure has managed to cope well. We been getting to some areas, other areas having some incredibly speedy responses. So um, overall, I think it was, it was an impressive uh, effort. Councillor Darby, question online. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Uh, just, so, uh, just back to Ross. Uh, Ross, um, with the cliff failures, coastal cliffs and others, of course, um, there's a lot of debris in the coastal marine area, like um, a lot of trees, soil, rock, um, and um, people are wondering, well, what, what do they do? Um, what are the communications that are going out to those that are affected? Uh, there are instances of people going out and um, I've seen it um, chainsawing away at Putakawa at the tops of cliffs that actually may not be the smartest thing to do. Um, you know, what when when debris is in the coastal marine area, whose is it and how should people be responding? But more importantly, what is the message package that is going out and how is that going out? Through the chat. Um, thank you for that question. This is a fairly complex and controversial topic, um, and it's something that we haven't um, sent out specific communications on to date. Uh, we've been focused very much on the emergency response and the uh, recommendations to people about keeping themselves safe um, from landslides, from floods. Uh, and we didn't want to um, cause communication overload uh, and water down those safety messages with other messages at the same time. However, I think it is now the time to get onto those, and I agree that we can um, focus on that in, in the coming days. It is a complex area when it comes to responsibility, and there is a mixture of private and public land that's affected. If it is all on private land, um, legally it is a private issue, uh, and that becomes very challenging for people to deal with, because it's something that homeowners would normally have to do. Uh, and we certainly don't recommend that people get out with a chainsaw and start chopping up trees on uh, steep slopes. Uh, and likewise, we don't recommend that they do it in the um, coastal marine area either. So if it's on the foreshore, it's generally much better to leave it be um, rather than try and chop it up. Uh, we don't want to create a shipping hazard, and the harbour master has an important role to play in making sure that the um, most dangerous pieces are dealt with. So it's good to report those through to the council hotline and see if the harbour master can support in those cases. Where we're looking at uh, rockfall or soil that's fallen onto the foreshore, in general, the um, only appropriate response is to let natural processes take their course. Um, there are not very many um, sensible and safe approaches to going in and taking that sort of material out. And I think the first slide that I showed was probably a good example of that, where there was a rockfall um, at narrow neck and the um, best response there is not to try and dig it out because it's a, it's a challenging place to work. In the coastal marine zone, you've got the, the tidal influence that means you've got very short working windows and you've got environmental impacts of having plant there, as well as the danger of working underneath a potentially unstable cliff. So the best bet is to, to let nature take its course. Cliffs do erode and the material that the tow does over time erode as well. Thanks, Ross. Right, uh, Thanks, Ross. Thank you very much, Ross. Okay, just a couple of questions, uh, Councillor Fully and Councillor Hills. Tola, thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I just really wanted to commend you, Parol, and your entire team. Um, you know, Rob, uh, Rob and um, uh, all the others, Richard, and everybody for your efforts um, during the floods and the effect that that had on our community in Mangere. You know, your response was always really prompt, and I know that your team was working extremely hard to help our communities out in Mangere and in South Auckland to clear their rubbish away. So I really want to commend you and your team for that effort. Um, my question is about going forward. Are we still 
is the message still to our families that they can put rubbish onto the curbside? And then do you still want me to be feeding that information through to you and the team to let you know which are the hot zones? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, that is appropriate at the moment in terms of flood damage material. Please continue to put it on the curbside. We do have trucks collecting. And uh, let us know that it is on the curbside and we will ensure that that material is correct, collected. Kia ora, thank you. And can people still call to request a skip? Because I get that question all the time as well. Uh, yes, for any flood damage material, yes, you can request a skip. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for that. Okay, thank you. Final question, uh, Councillor Hills. Uh, thank you, Chair Watson. Um, yeah, just want to also acknowledge you, Parul. I think I can claim the, the first containers in Auckland went to um, Sunny Nook after I know the initial response was to wait for insurers, but that was clearly going to be a pretty dangerous situation with the piles and piles of uh, rubbish. And just want to acknowledge that the, the teams, the contractors in those trucks, especially down Nile Road, which I think was seven or eight days of complete removal, those workers were in essentially sewage-soaked rubbish for days and days. It was horrendous. Um, but they had smiles on their faces and they were trying their best to make people feel um, okay when they're seeing everything they've ever owned being removed, which was pretty heartbreaking in those situations. So they just part, if you could pass that on. Uh, I guess my question just around um, the cost of this, and is there any way, and it probably isn't, um, to go back to the some of the insurers and others, because I know that insurers over the last week or so have been telling people, don't worry, council, just call council um, because they're covering it. And I know that's what we didn't want to do, but we're sort of getting to the place where insurers should be able to manage this process now on smaller, on a smaller scale. When it was big streets with big piles, I get it, but is there sort of some pushback or message going to the um, insurers that actually they should be covering it now? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, the message has remained similar in terms of insurance should cover. But what we have found in certain situations that people are insured, they're not insured enough. Okay. So I think the message for us has always been we are here to help people who cannot um, cover it by themselves. Uh, and in terms of uh, areas where we have found that the house belongs to Housing New Zealand or others, and we found insurance companies saying, can you cover this, we've actually pushed back. And you said, actually, this is your responsibility. If it comes to a health uh, issue or a safety issue, we would get in there and do it uh, and not argue over who pays for it at that point in time. But we've definitely pushed in terms of where the cost lies. Cool. Just thank you so much for your responsiveness and being so flexible with changing the rules almost hourly at some points in that first week. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you, Parul and Ross, for coming up again. Our final two presenters on, on the, the flood response uh, can come from Auckland Transport, I think it would probably be appropriate. To, uh, thank you for your, your patience, folks. So we've got uh, Murray Burt and Andrew Allen and perhaps a, uh, a couple of other people. And uh, then we'll, we'll, we'll finish off this item to do with the, the infrastructure impacts, OK? Uh, Mark, would you like to, to introduce the presenters? Thank you, um, Chair. And Tanakata Kata, and good afternoon, councillors. Um, I'll hand over in a minute to Andrew Allen, who's our um, EGM for service delivery and who's spearheaded our response um, to these events. And also Murray Burtz here, our chief engineer, who's leading our recovery phase, um, which we commenced um, a few days ago. Firstly, um, I would like to thank um, the council and um, councillors and all the agencies that we've been working with over the last however long, two or three weeks. Um, it seems quite an intense period, obviously. Um, but thank you to emergency services, to council departments, water care, um, and Waka Kotahi, who we've been um, working extremely closely with. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Aucklanders um, for listening to the communications we've been putting out, um, particularly around um, keeping off the roads to um, only driving uh, where necessary. It has helped us and it's helped, I know, certainly our other partner agencies. 
Um, before I hand over to Andrew, I'd just like to do a quick summary. Um, and most of this is based on the initial response rather than the cyclone, um, but certainly I'll be able to provide a few more um, numbers around that as well. So AT has been plugged into the Auckland Emergency Management um, uh, arrangements and responses um, for Auckland. Um, we are based and we work out of what's called ATOC, um, the Auckland Transport Operations Centre, which for those who don't know, um, is based in Smelts Farm. Um, and it's a joint venture initiative with uh, Waka Kotahi. So out of that um, control room, Waka Kotahi is managing the upper North Island. Um, and obviously Auckland Transport is managing um, the local transport network um, in Auckland. Uh, we operate 24-7 and we permanently um, have rosters in place and um, during the hours of 5 a.m. and 10 p.m. and pretty much every day for the last three uh, weeks, uh, we've been operating our enhanced incident management team. Um, just a couple of numbers. Um, on the Saturday, 28th of January, following the original event, um, there was around just over 100 roads were closed. Um, and as of two weeks ago, uh, sorry, two weeks later, there was 11 um, roads closed. And Murray's team is now working through, or was working through, how long those um, roads would take to um, fully repair and clear. Um, at the moment, uh, we have um, 62 roads fully closed um, and another 47 which um, have partial closures. We replaced one bridge um, within six days with the significant help from Wakakata and um, one abutment repair. Across the rail network, there was 20 slips um, and five major slips. And I know Andrew will talk about parking enforcement and um, towing um, abandoned cars and, and cars caught in the floodwaters. Um, I think we've towed um, in the last three weeks um, or, uh, around 2,600 cars, um, which is just incredible. Um, as I say, we have commenced our recovery phase at the moment, which our Chief Engineer Murray Bird is leading. Um, um, but on, on that note, I'll hand over to Andrew to go through some more of the detail. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And Tenakoto Katoa. Um, Mark's probably stolen most of my thunder around the Auckland Transport Operations Centre. I wasn't going to spend a lot of time here, so I probably will move on to the next slide. All I wanted to really cover off, in addition to what Mark said, is that that Auckland Transport Operations Centre monitors, as he said, the network, both ours and Waka Katahi's roading network, and our public transport services in real time, 24-7, 365. Um, and they respond to, on the right-hand side of that slide, uh, you can see some of the sorts of um, areas that they are across monitoring, and their focus is really to detect issues and then deploy our contractors or our resources to address and restore the network to its normal operating conditions. So the next slide is just also by way of a bit of a context. We have focused quite heavily on trying to get out to the best of our abilities communication um, so the people had a pretty clear understanding from the 27th through to current day um, what was happening across the transport network, both from a roading perspective and from a public transport perspective. I'm not going to dwell on this for too long, just probably a, a few key takeouts. We have been doing two to three media releases a day um, and trying to focus in on current issues and disruptions and delays, roads that are closed. Those media releases, as I say, going out two to three times a day. Um, we've had a website running from the very first day of the event, and that website we've been endeavouring to keep up to date in real time. Um, acknowledging that sometimes things are happening and unfolding quicker than we can update a website. Um, but that website has been in place and remains in place. Um, and we've also dedicated resources to um, ensuring that the work that all of you, our elected members, do in terms of representing your communities uh, do get answers to your questions and your queries as you're firing them through and getting them through to us. So we've had resources in place, and hopefully your experience has been one where you've been able to get access to good quality information to date. I might hand over now to Murray, who's going to take us through some of the impacts. And, and as Mark's touched on, I will do that too for some of the areas. Sure. Thanks, Andrew. And kia ora, everyone. Um, as Mark said, I'm Murray, the Chief Engineer at Auckland Transport. And I've had some first-hand experience of the flood when the water started coming through uh, my garage door and then filled up the ground floor of my house. Uh, and also my previous job working with the United Nations, I've been involved in response and recovery on a major 
floods in Bangladesh and, and earthquakes in Haiti and other places. So trying to apply some of that skills and knowledge here in Auckland. The impact on the Auckland roads has, has been quite large, really massive impact. In uh, the flood event, um, we had over 300 uh, slips come down onto the road in different places. And we did some rapid work uh, in the days after that. And pretty soon in the, in the following days, we had uh, more than 85 of the roads reopened. And uh, like Mark said, we were down to only 11 closures before the next event, the cyclone hit, where we had uh, straight away another 150 roads closed. And we're already doing a lot of work towards reopening many of those. And it's changing every day. Um, but the latest reports that I've had is that we now have access open to all communities and that the final community that we're, we're just cutting through some tree trunks now to open up at least single lane access is down in Kerry Kerry. So we've got uh, single lane access into Piha for residents and emergency vehicles. Uh, Murawai, we've opened up those roads also for residents. And, and Scenic Drive is the other area where we have some large slips, at least five slips on Scenic Drive, but we're managing to get access for, for all uh, residents in that area. Helping us in this effort, obviously, is, is our contractors, and we've got over 550 workers out there on the network um, cleaning up uh, slips and, and, and working on opening up the road. And obviously, other areas of concern is uh, the Afitu Peninsula, a major slip there, and uh, Great Barrier Island, where we've also got um, debris on the road. Just to see the scale of some of these uh, sites that we're working with, um, some of these uh, underslips and overslips are enormous, and it will take us some time to get engineering assessments and uh, work out ways that we can rebuild uh, these roads, and in some cases, at least one, there's a possibility we might have to look at a road realignment uh, up in, in the Rodney district uh, to be able to reopen access just because of the size of the slips that we're dealing with. We've also had impacts on our bridges. Uh, one bridge completely washed away in Millflat Road up uh, near the Coatesville area, and another bridge, uh, Sherwood Drive, where the abutments were washed out. And I guess the good news is that our contractors I was able to mobilise very quickly and get the Millflat Road bridge, uh, a Bailey Bridge in replacement there within a week. So we're able to open up that road. But obviously the, the long-term rebuild of that bridge will take some time as we work through a design process. And I guess this is one of these areas where we're looking at um, what, to what level of standard do we rebuild back and thinking about resilience, thinking about uh, climate change, and obviously that bridge was not built to withstand a flood of this level and uh, thinking about redesigning to, to meet 100 year flood standards or should it be something higher? So those are broader design questions. On the stormwater network, um, I know that Craig McElroy has touched on this. Healthy Waters obviously takes a lead role in uh, maintaining the stormwater work network, including the catch pits on the roads. Um, but maybe just a couple of things to highlight here that often these uh, road stormwater networks under traditional New Zealand design standards are designed for relatively small storms, so one in 10 or one in 20 year storms. Um, and then after that, there's an expectation that there'll be flow uh, across the road in a 100 year flow path. So that also is possibly another area that we need to relook at in terms of adaptation and what are the design standards that we build to. But a good example um, that you can see here in these pictures, we worked uh, very closely with Healthy Waters where we identified a culvert uh, on Wolverton Road in a previous flood event uh, that was declared to be uh, not robust and not right sized and also had cracks in the culvert. So we pushed through under Emergency Works a major replacement program uh, jointly with Healthy and um, you can see on the bottom right that that culvert held up very well. The road stayed dry, the water was flowing through it. Uh, and I guess that just shows the difference between new infrastructure down the bottom and old infrastructure around Green Lane where we saw surcharging coming onto the road. Um, in the area of public transport, 
obviously disruptions on the network, whether it's uh, slips on the rail line or uh, flooding or slips onto the road mean that uh, the public transport uh, operations are disrupted and detours have to be put in place. Often these detours are real time, and I have a friend who's a bus driver telling me how she was out on the network driving her bus, getting radio calls in from the bus operator saying, there's a slip up ahead of you, you need to detour and, and take a different route. So that um, type of information is going out through the, the ATOC, the Auckland Transport Operations Centre, in conjunction with the public transport operators to be able to manage those real time uh, detours and diversions. In terms of the ferry network, all the debris floating in the harbour, uh, tree trunks and so on that Ross was talking about, cause other hazards for ferries, and we've had at least two ferries that have hit uh, floating debris and brake propellers. And this only goes towards uh, disruptions in the ferry network that uh, we already had issues around uh, shortages of crews on the ferry network and then now with some vessels uh, hitting logs and having maintenance problems, that also brings uncertainty. We've done a lot to communicate with our customers through this process and th keep them updated through uh, our, our website, our mobile apps and, and social media. Back to Andrew to talk about abandoned vehicles and parking. Um, yeah, this slide won't take very long. The number uh, that Mark referred to has actually changed quite dramatically from when these slides were prepared. So we're sitting at uh, in excess of 6,000 vehicles that have been towed that were re either flood damaged or are insurance claims or have been removed uh, for safety reasons from the network and from flood struck areas. I think the only other point I'd just note here is in terms of all of our car parks, the only one that sustained flooding and damage has been the Civic car park and has required us to close that car park, at least levels two and three on occasion. Um, that's by and large now been restored and cleared. I'll move on to the next slide. Um, and a number of people have touched on the efforts of the Harbour Master to date. Um, that image just demonstrates um, or shows some of the sorts of um, debris that we've had to pull out of the harbour in the last few weeks. Um, there have been about, about four barge loads of material removed. That's 50 to 60 tonne of material removed from the harbour um, in order to enable things like um, ferries and, and other shipping to resume safely. Um, the other thing I would just comment on the number of full recreational boats that have sunk. Those numbers have changed since the slot was prepared and Gabriella has come through. So there are now six recreational boats that we are aware of that have sunk and in the process of trying to contact owners and salvage those. And there are a further eight um, recreational boats that have broken free from their moorings and have been grounded. I think the other point that, is, that has occurred since these slides were prepared uh, and in preparedness and readiness for Gabrielle arriving is that the Harbour Master, in conjunction with Ports of Auckland, has required that all large ships head out to sea before Gabrielle made landfall. Uh, and all of those providers headed out to sea, all of those ships went out to sea, some of them anchored out in the Rocky Gulf and others went out to sea. Um, there was one exception to that, and that was the Arcadia, the cruise ship that remained alongside for safety reasons um, throughout the process or throughout the duration of uh, Gabrielle making landfall. Um, and I'll hand back to Murray just to have, cover off a little on recovery. Sure. Thanks, Andrew. So the picture you can see there is the Milfat Road Bailey Bridge uh, now open for traffic. Uh, I thought that was a fabulous effort getting that uh, put in so quickly. And I guess that kicked off part of our recovery program, which probably will swing into full force uh, next week as we look to do detailed assessments of all the damage across the network. Uh, document that, start to understand what the costs will be to repair and replace uh, these damaged assets. And particularly we're looking at um, the bridges, the, the slips on the roads, and also significant damage to road pavements, as well as other asset classes where, like for instance, the Civic Car Park will need some assessment of uh, structural integrity and so on uh, as we move forward. So a, a lot's going on. We're classifying it into first phase recovery where we can do things quickly within the first month, but then there will be those outstanding projects um, that will take much longer and we'll need to communicate very clearly with communities in a two-way communication of what's going on and how long it will take to, to fix things up. 
and then uh, working obviously with our funding partners, Waka Katahi, on how we look to uh, fund, fund the repairs. So thank you very much. Open to questions. Yeah, thank you very much. And if you need a, any backup to that barge that was clearing the harbour, you can maybe use the, your bus that was going through the water at only hung there. Just put it on Trade Me, you'll make a fortune. <laughs> Councillor Stewart. Oh, thank you for that update. Can you just tell me at what time on the 27th of January were you first made aware that we had a serious emergency happening? Through the chair. Um, we were first made aware, I can't tell you the exact time off the top of my head, but it was around 8 o'clock that we were first met in the evening. We already had an IMT stood up, so an incident management team stood up, and the reason for that was on that night, as probably many people will remember, we had a large concert planned at Mount Smart. Uh, and so what we typically do for those large concerts is we do stand up a team to manage the flow of people to and from those events. Uh, and also organise and manage all of the special event services that are put on for those large events. So that team was already in place from earlier in the afternoon, and obviously um, as we saw this weather event unfolding and the information coming through from Auckland Emergency Management, we pivoted from managing a special event to managing a flood event during the course of the night. So you got no nobody alerted you to... A situation, even though it was being played out on, on social media, nobody alerted you. The, the, the information we had was around the sort of um, data that was shared earlier by, I think it was Craig, in terms of a, a storm event coming through, but we were not anticipating, based on the forecast, anything near the scale of what actually arrived. So those forecasts were around 20 millimetres of rain coming through. That was what we were aware of, and when we stood up our IMT, what we were kind of anticipating, but that is not what unfolded. Councillor Stewart, and just a quick question on that myself. Uh, Andrew, you mentioned that the team that was working uh, on the, the event team in preparation for the concert, um, there, there was a lot of uh, talk and focus on the uh, adequacy of the service that was getting put on to that concert that last night, I, I regard it with a bit of academic interest myself because I know that in terms of the Eden Park concert with Billy Joel just a short while ago, the same questions were raised and, you know, uh, AT pulled that off without uh, too much trouble at all. Um, what was, was that attention a, a, a distraction uh, in terms of the developments on that day? Because my assumption was that it was well under control, just like how it was under control with Billy Joel and indeed with major events over the last decade that Auckland Transport's been involved with in terms of catering for these events. Um, Chair, it's a great question. Um, the, the key point of difference in terms of how we cater to these large-scale events has been the work that's now happening on the Kiwi Rail Network with the rebuild process and the impact that that then has on the rail network and the services we can provide on the rail network. So um, while we are very used to managing access to and from large events with event organisers, and it's not just an Auckland Transport response, there are a number of entities that come into play here, um, we're used to doing that with train services. And it's probably fair to say that the, the, the biggest load of people moving to and from an event is typically carried by train, both at Mount Smart and Eden Park. Uh, and the issue with Billy Joel, of course, is that we didn't have trains running. It's the first time that we've had a major concert in Auckland at Eden Park with no trains running. So that required a huge amount of energy and effort to going into how we take what would typically be circa 18,000 people who get to that event by train and find alternative mechanisms to enable them to get to the concert. We did pull out all stops in terms of... Um, finding other areas for people to park and walk, park and ride, running shuttles, special event buses, buses direct from the North Shore straight through to the park. There were a raft of initiatives that were put in place to manage the lack of rail for Billy Joel. That is going to be an issue for us. The, the, the impact on the rail network is going to continue to be an issue moving forward for the next few years as we focus on this, or Kiwi Rail focus on the rebuild of the rail network. Um, the night of Elton John that you refer to, uh, I think it is fair to say that, like for Billy Joel, we had a raft 
of um, transport alternatives or initiatives in place to enable the movement of people to and from that event. The unfortunate element there is that there was some confusion within our organisation and an unfortunate social media posting got made advising people to travel by car. At no point in time was it ever our intention to only have people travel to that event by car, but that got out into the environment and I think everybody got really concerned that there was no other provision or no other alternatives in place for people to get to that event. That is categorically not true. Uh, and as I say, there were special event buses. There were actually trains running on the night of Elton John, but the Penrose station was not operational. So we had to shuttle people from there to the next station. That was an impact in terms of the rail. Um, but we had a raft of initiatives in place to enable people to travel on that night. OK, thank you. Uh, just two final questions, Councillor Lee and Councillor Ferry. Yes, I, I had a bit to um, say about the um, uh, Elton John concert and the arrangements on that particular day, but let's put that behind us. Um, um, I, I would say, though, but uh, if it wasn't for the, that flood event, there would have been quite a lot of media fallout over uh, what happened um, that weekend or, or what was planned for that week or not planned. Leaving that aside, I want to get back to the, the question of catch pits, the importance of which has been uh, brought home to us um, in the last couple of weeks or, or so. Um, in, in regard to cleaning catch pits, is it um, the responsibility of Auckland Transport to notify healthy waters, or does Auckland Transport rely on uh, um, healthy waters to notify that there's an interface here and obviously room for um, confusion. So is there a regime um, about who notifies who about when a catch pit needs cleaning out? And we won't go into the details of how regular that is. That's something that um, needs to be talk, talked about. But wh whose responsibility is it to notify the cleaning of catch pits? Thank you, uh, Councillor Lee. Th through the chair, I can respond to that. Um, so basically how it works is uh, Auckland Transport has a contract with Healthy Waters to clean catch pits uh, on a routine basis of one cleaning per year for each catch pit. Uh, so that happens through uh, Healthy Waters programs the work and manages that themselves um, for, for that routine cleaning. If we get a call uh, from the public or notification from the public that there's an issue, then Auckland Transport can request uh, Healthy Waters to do a exceptional or special cleaning. And prior to the flood event, uh, a number of hotspots were identified where Auckland Transport requested for Healthy Waters to do uh, additional cleaning prior to the, the cyclone. And my understanding is that that uh, cleaning was, was undertaken. And generally, to describe, there's a close working relationship between Healthy Waters and Auckland Transport. Um, but the communication flow for any exceptional cleaning would come normally through the Auckland Transport uh, Customer Request Management System. Um, so thank you very much for that. Clearly, once a year um, is not really sufficient, I would say, but that's something to be discussed. Thank you. Councillor Fury. Thank you. Um, hopefully reasonably quick question. Um, thinking about the fixes that are happening in the system right now and the plans to potentially build things back, um, what considerations being given to identifying those assets where actually there's an opportunity to come up with a, a, a better route or we need to accept that actually there's some managed retreat at play here? And how will those be identified and then communicated clearly to the community to manage expectations? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question uh, through the chair. I guess I can't give a definitive answer because some of these things have, uh, I guess, 
there's wider policy decisions around them and there's, there's a wider conversation within the council group about climate uh, adaptation and so on. But I guess in short answer, the way that Auckland Transport is prioritising its work at the moment is to restore some form of access to all communities in, in Auckland City. And as I said, by the end of today, uh, all communities in, in Auckland, including Carry Carry, will have some form of access to their properties um, through, through the roading network. Um, in terms of as we build back, those longer term questions about adaptation, resilience and building back better, part of that is related to what we're funded to do um, and broader decisions at, at that policy level around funding. Um, I think I can say that whatever we build back will be to modern day standards. So standards change and evolve over time. So for instance, the, the bridge standards have changed over time and whatever we build back for Mill Flat Road Bridge will be in accordance with the, the accepted standards of today. Um, and any realignments that we look at would be built in, in accordance with current day standards. Thank you. Councillor okay. Stewart. Yes, uh, just thank you for that. Just on the reporting a problem, um, when people ring and report a problem, it usually it's for the whole council family. And often what I hear is, and I'm sure you may hear it as well, that people report a problem only to be emailed back very shortly after they've reported it that the job has been completed and it's obvious it hasn't and sometimes they can report it four, five, six times, it could even be three, four weeks they're reporting the same problem. So I'm just wondering if there's a fall down somewhere in the system, whether it's the call centre and not getting the reported problem to say Auckland Transport or Healthy Waters or Water Care or whatever. So I think that's something we have to look at. But normally what would happen if somebody reports a problem that comes to Auckland Transport, if you haven't dealt with it, do you just do you have staff that just say, well, look, just say it's been completed? and Because that's what we're hearing is happening. Is, is that, can you answer that? I think the old, Murray can add if, I, if, if he thinks I've missed anything up, but absolutely we don't have staff who um, are directed to just say things have been closed out when they haven't. Uh, that would be, yeah, that would be, yeah, highly inappropriate. Uh, I think the point you make, Councillor, is a valid one, and we have identified some issues in terms of how the flow of information works, uh, and we are working with the Council Call Centre and our own call centre and our teams to look at how we can improve the credibility of that flow of information and the response times. So I guess if something happens and it's something to do with Auckland Transport, it's health and water, it's water care or whatever, if there's two or three departments that are all involved in it, that should all go to the three or four departments and then you all agree, tick, 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 it's been completed, it's all sorted. That seems to be one of the missing ingredients. Yeah, look, that's a great, great comment, and that's exactly what you would expect the case to be. Okay, uh, thank you. Look, I'm going to call an end to the, the the questions there. I know there's a few more people to go, but we've got an, another couple of pretty substantive items to come. So, uh, thank you for our Auckland Transport uh, presenters. There, I'll call upon a uh, Councillor Stewart and Councillor Williamson to to uh, move that we receive this interim update on the impact of the Auckland floods, which has covered all our presenters uh, today on our infrastructure, and uh, really appreciate the, the, the detail, the insight, and the clear messaging that uh, this is now going to be something that we're going to have to follow with uh, some degree of diligence, and this will hopefully be the committee to do that. So um, it's been moved, it's seconded. Um, all those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. Um, so, so we move on to um, item 11 now, which is the Auckland Transport update. Um, uh, and the purpose of this item, is, as we realise, is to provide an update on the pub public transport patronage uh, and today fair pricing um, issues and opportunity, the ongoing shortages of uh, bus drivers and, and the performance of the 
the PT network, which this uh, committee has signalled as one of its top priorities. Um, as I understand it, Mark, the, the presentation is going to kick off with, with the ferries. Is that correct? Okay, so I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for the regular opportunity now to um, report into this committee um, on key issues of uh, joint concern and what we're doing about it and to have a good discussion and debate around uh, these aspects. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Derek Coper, who's our GM of uh, Metro Services, our public transport network, and also Richard Harrison, who's our uh, manager for public transport service optimization as well. Um, we are, of course, um, in the process of responding to the Mayor's letter of expectation. Uh, we are preparing our statement of intent uh, at the moment. And um, I would like to think we have started to look in terms of how we can respond to a number of those um, key themes and requests and starting to put in place some um, actions to um, improve that direction. For example, um, engaging better with local boards and elected members Hopefully, um, you would have seen a, a significant enhancement to communications over the last few weeks. And um, that's one example we have focused on recently to try and improve and respond sooner rather than later to the letter of expectation. Um, today's discussion really is um, working with the chair and deputy chair to set the agenda. It's focused on some key areas of um, opportunity and concern. So we will talk about ferry performance, um, bus driver shortage, public transport patronage, um, some recovery and enhancement opportunities that we are um, looking at and progressing, use of PT data and planning, and I know that's been a question from a number of councillors, and I would like to, um, after this meeting, um, uh, engage with each one of you as to whether you wish to have, a, and I know some of you do, a one-on-one -on -one deep dive into PT data, and um, particularly bus performance in your particular ward, so we can actually pick that apart a little bit. Um, also, we'll talk about the um, annual fare review, which is part of our proposed um, budget for FY24. Um, but of course, given the um, events of recent weeks, we've um, deferred that at this point. So on that note, I'll hand over to Derek, who will um, talk through the ferries chair. Thank you, Mark. Kia ora, everyone. Um, it is fair to say that performance across ferry services with disruptions and cancellations is disappointing, especially with um, fallers, crew shortage, and vessel breakdowns. Team, our team is actively managing the operational aspects impacting customers and working on initiatives to improve customer experience. Ferry patronage recorded, uh, recovered to pre-COVID levels, and it is our priority to maintain that growth with continued investment in ferries. Where performance is poor, we are working with operators to resolve and assess um, other formal options to improve performance um, and under those contracts to influence change. However, our principles are based on partnering approach. Across all ferry services, despite cancellations, um, there is sufficient capacity across all 80 contracted services, but there are capacity issues on the Devonport ferries when vessels are not fully crewed, leaving passengers behind, particularly in the peak. Full as we are possible, have been deploying second uh, vessel to pick up customers left behind, and it happens typically within 15 to 20 minutes where it is possible. Um, this, this graph highlights the, we, we, we report separately on Devonport when the service became Auckland Transport uh, Service under the um, gross contract arrangements. We at Devonport Services um, reported about 2% of trips that have um, had high loadings in the peak. Since since 2000, uh, you know, early 2022, service delivery by Fullest 360 have, has been impacted by crew shortages, vessel reliability, and most recently the impacts of the Auckland flood and, and um, storm event. While Fullest, uh, Fullest 360 have had moderate success in uh, increasing crew levels, their ability to recruit continues to be impacted, in part by availability of suitably qualified personnel within the New Zealand market, 
and this challenge is being experienced by all ferry operators in the Auckland region with others um, filling their vacancies with um, crew from within the, the sector. Fullis currently operates 20 vessels across the range of 80 contracted services, the Waikiki route and other commercial services. For 80 contracted services, the peak of the ferry requirement is 15 vessels. Fullis also recently completed the purchase of two additional vessels included in the 20 um, that I mentioned uh, from Explore Group to bolster their fleet. Four vessels are now owned by Auckland Transport and are subject to planned refurbishment over the next 9 to 12 months. One of the vessels, Wanderer, is due to be completed by the end of um, February and is expected to be in service um, by April after uh, sea trials and necessary crew recertifications. There are also um, five new hybrid and electric vessels being sourced with two currently under construction for delivery in late 2024. Fullers uh, schedule their vessels and crew across the, their network. Um, there are no dedicated vessels and crews for the routes as long as the vessels perform within the prescribed vehicle standards on each contract. Operational roster requires them to have 53 sets of crews to operate those 20 vessels. Full crew comprised of qualified skipper plus deckhands and onboard supervisors. Each vessel needs to, to have at least one master specifically trained for one vessel. Um, and the size and capacity of the vessel dictates the number of deck and, non, and onboard supervisors required to operate the service safely and efficiently. Um, there are currently 38 full sets of crew available with a shortfall of about 15 sets um, or 30% of the minimal required. Um, this means that Fullers cannot cover any short-term unplanned engineering or crewing issues with two fully backup vessels. In the interim, five um, return Gulf Harbor trips currently are being replaced by bus diverting one vessel to provide some resilience for vessel maintenance and staff absentees, but also to provide some um, certainty for those customers from that area of getting um, of traveling on the day. And Fullers have also contracted um, a crew resource from the Explorer Group who are trained on those vessels that have, they have purchased to operate those vessels on their behalf. And as you can see on the slide, currently we are still 36, 36 individual um, crew members short for our contracted services. So in terms of cancellations, in December, until December, we saw, um, we have a slide later, we saw an improvement or reduction in the cancelled trips. Um, however, in January, those cancelled trips uh, show an increase with capacity issues on certain popular peak Devonport and Waiheke services. Um, and just to note that Waiheke service is obviously exempt and non-contracted service. In terms of um, our recovery plan for improving uh, ferry operations, Fullers have provided AT with recruitment plan and their talent strategy in August um, last year to address their crew shortage. They have undertaken the process to successfully gain accredited employer status under the um, work visa scheme, um, but report that employing from overseas markets is still a complex and the immigration and steps required to re for recognition of the overseas maritime qualifications limit the, the market. However, they have engaged external consultants and they are with, in discussion with overseas resource and subject to immigration processes and personal circumstances of those um, looking to immigrate. Um, they plan to recruit 10 qualified um, crew members. Um, from my perspective, we also, sorry, the Fullers also have increased their pay to retain uh, their staff and have refreshed their um, employee benefits as well as have implemented a training program to upskill people from deckhands to, to more qualified positions to fulfill their requirements. From my perspective, we have uh, regular meetings with 
Forest focuses on issue resolutions, um, disruptions, communications, and alternative transport. We have deployed additional resources uh, at Devonport, and we have dedicated additional resource to help um, resolve the current situation and complete that transition from under new contracts. And we are also engaging with Ports of Auckland to minimize any additional disruptions from cruise ships or any other uh, vessels entering the harbour outside of their scheduled times. We do have a contractual arrangement via payment deductions for services not meeting route performance, uh, minimum thresholds uh, uh, process, and we also have other contractual, contractual mechanisms to improve um, that customer experience. Cure plan is the last resort. Um, we a formal process can enter. There are some thresholds to be achieved to do that um, if those shortfalls, for example, in, in crew are not achieved over a longer period of time. I must say, though, that just like with bus drivers, we've been working with all bus operators, including including the ferry operators, on, on um, working together with them under the partnering principles to address the crew shortage across all public transport modes and have lobbied um, central government where possible to support that. So in terms of those cancellations, as I mentioned, you can see that they have been um, reducing until end of December. Uh, we don't have data for January yet, but we know that those cancellations have increased. In terms of um, uh, our process, we, we currently focus on uh, working with, with fullers in particular to manage to minimize those cancellations with proactive um, arrangements for uh, alternative transport where possible to provide some certainty to some uh, ferry users. Um, we have attended a meeting, meeting in Gulf Harbor late last year, taken on board some of the feedback. Um, we also um, want to just note that reliability that we report is the contractual reliability. It's not the customer facing. So for example, um, cancellations that you see are not um, are, are measured separately. They they not part of our reliability uh, criteria. But Richard, my colleague here, will will explain that shortly. We have worked underway to improve our disruption communications, um, and we have a dedicated team now to focus on improving that and accelerating the transition from um, fullers largely managing that process previously to more AT led. Um, uh, disruption management through using our tools, um, and we're looking to do this as soon as possible. I now hand over to Richard to cover some of the other performance measures. Thank you, Derek. Kira Koto. Um, so I'm knowing that the committee is prioritising monitoring the ongoing performance of public transport through this crisis. Uh, and the purpose of these slides is to simply to share some of the key measures for public transport and highlight some of the current performance based on monthly reporting. I'm not going to go into the detail of the reporting here, as Mark said. I'm happy to come and give you more details about specific routes or specific areas. Uh, we have a lot of data and, and analysis available. Um, and yesterday we began a weekly commentary uh, that was sent to all, all members of the committee, uh, just giving a summary of the previous week's performance in public transport, giving an overview of where things are going, and that's where you'll get the latest information. So these are the, the key performance measures for public transport. Um, we focus on the measures that reflect what matters most to Aucklanders. So that's the, the patronage, so are people using the service, and that's how we assess the demand and the effectiveness of a service. The reliability, did the service actually run? And as Derek said, I'll just point to the definitions uh, across the different modes. They do differ because of the contract arrangements with operators. And in the ferry space, we actually measure reliability only on the services that are actually operated. So cancellations are tracked separately. And then we look at the reliability, the ability of a ferry service to complete its trip. Uh, and then the third key measure there is punctuality, of course. Did the service arrive on time? So can customers expect it to be available to them when they need it? Um, in terms of timeframes, uh, we, we measure every single trip. Uh, we look at them through the day. We look at intraday um, and days of the week for our planning purposes, but for governance purposes, weekly and monthly are the best views to share because they give an overall picture and a good view of trends. So to the next slide. This is an example of the bus performance. Uh, this is a, a monthly report looking back over January. Um, a couple of things to highlight in here. On the bottom right, shortfall. When we produced these slides, that was the snapshot at the time that has changed again. 
Um, the shortfall in bus drivers had reduced by 111 from before Christmas, so early December, uh, come down to mid 400s. And uh, last week, we've had some more new recruits join the workforce, and this drops below 400 for the first time. So we're at 393 right now, short in bus drivers. Um, and I'll just highlight this is broken out by operator, bus operator, Howick and Easton near the bottom. They put some new recruits on. They've now reached their required number of drivers, so they're able to operate the full service. And to be fair, they were doing a great job of managing through this crisis, and they were operating most of their services anyway. Other things in there, you can clearly see through the reliability figures. This is where our concerns are. We're facing issues with reliability caused by the shortage of bus drivers. But the punctuality measured on the services that are actually operating, that's fairly strong across the networks. So we're able to maintain punctuality. We're going to a quick overview of the train performance. Uh, it's useful to split that out by lines, particularly through the rail network rebuild, to understand the impacts on the different lines. Um, and there's no shortage of frontline staff in train. AOR were able to re resolve the shortage of train managers in the middle of 2022. So what we're tracking here and, and reporting on is commentary on the rail network rebuild and how that's impacting services. What's the difference between punctuality and reliability. Um, so reliability is did the service actually operate? In, in bus, it's did it start from its first stop within 10 minutes of the scheduled time? Uh, and in train and ferry, it's did it arrive at its final point on the route? And punctuality is, was it at the, the start or the end of the route within five minutes of the advertised time? Assuming that Aucklanders are willing to wait up to five minutes, uh, but no longer than that. As an example of how we're tracking patronage, um, so we're giving an overview of both the absolute patronage week by week and how that compares to 2019, so the pre-COVID levels. Uh, since we submitted these slides, um, patronage has bounced back. And last week was 73% of the comparative week in 2019. So, so far in 2023, we're tracking around 70% of the 2019 levels. And that's putting us um, likely to end the year at the moment on 62 million total boardings for the 12-month period, which is slightly ahead of our revised statement of intent target. So generally, we're tracking well with patch and recovery. So on patch and recovery, um, we have got a dedicated team who are working on initiatives to try and um, encourage Aucklanders to retry public transport, come back to public transport. Uh, and also um, drive the reliability of the network so they can depend on it once they do return. The first two initiatives there have been really successful. So they, we had the Public Transport Careers Fair in uh, outside Britain Mark just before Christmas. That was really helpful in providing a, a pipeline of leads to bus operators and ferry operators. And we followed that up with a digital campaign that is still providing 50, 60 leads a week through to operators for them to then start the recruitment. And the mall activations is a, an important piece of work around getting out into the communities and explaining the benefits of public transport and challenging people to take a hop card and go and try public transport, see for themselves how it works. Yeah, we're on to the next slide. Thank you, Richard. So obviously one of the risks to recovery is the QRL um, network rebuild. And back in October, we communicated with all elected members and the mayor's office um, around the stage one of the disruptions between January and 19th of March. And we will be providing a similar more detailed briefing next week about stage two, which um, at this stage is planned to start from uh, 20th of March and it will affect the Eastern line. Uh, details will come in the briefing next week. Um, and we just had at this point, at that point in time, dates to be confirmed because it's so far indication from QRIO that there are no any additional uh, issues on the network that would prevent this from starting. Okay, back to the stats. Um, so this slide speaks to how we use the performance reporting to start to influence our planning, how we might adjust or enhance the network. So um, when we set out a planning new route, um, the planning team will set out an expectation of the boardings per service hour. So we use a boarding, we take the total boardings across the service, divide it by the number of hours that service was in service, so that we've got a comparable measure across routes. And we set an expectation because obviously routes have got different purposes. An NX1 is expected to be um, highly utilized, particularly in the peak times. But a rural service is existing more for connecting a community. And we would expect that to have lower boardings. We're not going to have such low frequency that we'd wait for a bus to fill up. 
So we set those expectations per route. And then each month, uh, my team, the service network development team, and the service operations team are reviewing all of the routes in the network against that expectation. And what we're looking for is, is the route delivering to its individual expectation, rather than is it, are they delivering the same numbers of boardings? Um, we uh, then check whether we are taking the appropriate actions to encourage use of that route. Bearing in mind that the, the RPTP sets out a number of steps that we need to go through before we even consider cancelling the service. And they include things like checking that the infrastructure is in place, that we're, any land development we're waiting for is in place, that we have taken steps to promote a service before we think about, um, sorry, taking steps to change a service as well before we think about removing it. So at the moment, um, the, these are... The, assessment, the count of the individual routes and how they're performing against the 70% recovery that we're seeing across the network, and somewhere between 15 and 25% of routes are below that 70% uh, that recovery rate. So they are not returning as quickly as the whole network. And then we're digging into those individual routes to try and understand the reasons why and whether we think we've got the right remedial actions in place. Um, and then just a future view of public transport development. Um, we are still looking to make improvements to the network as Auckland returns um, and patronage grows. Um, just a couple of the key things that are very important to us that we keep giving Aucklanders an alternative to the car. So we need to keep giving them reasons to travel. And we've got to address any demand shifts that come out of COVID. We've been watching the return carefully over the last year to understand whether people want to travel in different ways across the city rather than in and out of the city centre or whether they want to travel at different times. We've certainly seen a, a shift in the peak travel. Um, and we've got a project called Network Recast that is taking effect now, where we spent the last six months uh, assessing where we might be able to reduce some of the peak services and repurpose those to give more consistent service across the day. So we're starting to move uh, resource into, into peak services. Thanks, Derek. Thank you, Richard. I'll hand over to Mario to cover the next item. Sure, I'll take this. This is the final slide and final point. Uh, just an update on the the annual fare review. Um, members are probably aware that each year Auckland Transport uh, updates and adjusts its public transport fares in alignment with inflation. Um, we made no change during the COVID-19 period, so there's been no change for the last two years. Um, there was a proposal to make the fare adjustment in February this year. It's a relatively small amount. The maximum uh, for, for a single trip would be 40 cents, uh, but for many trips there would be no increase at all, uh, particularly for the longer zones. Uh, and I guess the key point to highlight here is given the flood events and the extraordinary circumstances that Auckland's faced, a decision's been made by the Auckland Transport Board to defer any fair increase until a point later in the year. Thank you. Thanks, team. Um, I'd like to take any questions now. Um, what I would like to re-emphasise um, is as we're going through our current um, response to the letter of expectation, we are, as I say, looking at each of those points in turn. What can we do now? What can we do immediately? And also, um, how do we set ourselves up for change moving forward? For example, um, uh, making better use of um, some of our transport corridors, all of our transport corridors, one of the key themes in the letter of expectation. Um, we are trying to fast track right now for the next few months. How can we um, uh, put in place some uh, priority uh, at traffic signals for buses as they're approaching using GPS tracking, and we'll be briefing the Mayor's Office on that um, fairly shortly. And also looking at dynamic lanes and how can we actually bring forward some opportunities there. Um, and as I say, communications, um, we feel more is better moving forward. Uh, you will be receiving, in fact, you should have already received a weekly update now on public transport performance. Um, the, uh, the driver shortages, what we're doing about that, and how we're, we're trying to um, fast track solutions to that. Um, so on that note, through the chair, um, open to questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, presenters. Uh, you, you'll see that we had this presentation uh, in, a, in a structured form in that it, the first part cut, cut off ferries, then PT performance and recovery, and then the fare review. It might make sense for us to take questions on those um, individual 
sections rather than jump backwards and forwards. There will be some recommendations coming at the end, but I think that would be helpful uh, both for the, the presenters and also uh, for anyone who's watching online. So the first part was to do with uh, ferries. So um, I'll, I'll quickly take some questions on the ferry presentation. Um, uh, Councillor, uh, Councillor Walker, and then uh, we'll, we'll just follow with anyone else who's got an interest. I think probably Councillor Darby will be interested in that as well. Okay, Councillor so, uh, Walker. So I've, I've, I've got a question around the uh, apparent conflict between um, financial profitability and contractual obligations as it applies to Gulf Harbour specifically. So the observation that uh, ferry users make because they're aware of what's happening across the network is that there are clear instances where the operator apparently chooses not to run, they would suggest because of financial reasons rather than um, contractual um, uh, obligations. Do you have any comment and do you have any oversight over that? Um, thanks, Councillor. Um, I can assure you it's not from financial um, issues. Um, it's primarily, as we've touched on, at this point in time from staffing shortages, um, which we're working with fullers closely with, and um, operational efficiencies across the whole network. So given that we've got a shortage of, of staff, how can we actually maximise um, delivery of, of services across all routes? Now, unfortunately, that means in some cases on some routes that we have to prioritise. Um, what we um, speak speaking to the fullers about and the team about now is as we look at the pipeline for new staff coming in, how can we give certainty back to customers on each route? Um, and that's not necessarily waiting for, for example, in Gulf Harbour, we're not going to put anything on until we've got a full complement of staff. How can we put some peak services back on with surety as we get, um, uh, as full as get a bit bigger complement of staff? So I can assure you, Council, that's what we are trying to do with fullers. Okay, and my other question, very quick, it just goes to communications that you mentioned, and it's an example. So at Gulf Harbour, there's a digital facility that should be advising people as to um, what's happening. It's not been functioning for some time. How soon are you going to rectify that? So are you saying the, the digital screen is not functioning? Yeah. Okay, well, we will follow Thank that you. up. Yeah. Okay, uh, Councillor Darby. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Mark and crew. Um, Mark, you know I'm not I'm not drawn into the you know I'm going to beat up AT today brigade, um, and I've been you know very supportive of of actually your initiative um, as an executive to really drag ferries up from being the poor third cousin, and and you've done remarkably well, and there's been some huge challenges. But look, I, like Councillor Hills and I and and others. You know, we've been getting it in the neck thick and fast um, on a regular basis from our constituents. And it's Devonport, it's Bayswater, it's Birkenhead, and there'll be other councillors getting it as well on the the situation we face with, um, you know, recruitment for, for ferry skills. I guess my question, Mark, is, you know, I, I did raise this at the board back in April, and I just didn't get a sense that the board or, or management were really on top of it. They didn't really get a sense of the enormity of this challenge. So can you just give us an idea of, you know, when did Auckland Transport um, um, grab this and realise that it wasn't just something they needed to be abreast of with operators, that they needed to uh, grab it by the scruff and start asking operators about their, you know, their retention plans, their, um, their um, recruitment plans, reviewing those plans, uh, looking at what barriers you might identify that they haven't identified, uh, looking at where people could be sourced, like do they go to Navy and hunt people down? Do they go to the commercial fishing industry and hunt people down? You know, did you compare notes with Bel Air and Explore who don't seem to have that problem? Could you just expand on that as to what you did way back in April as opposed to what you've been doing of recent? Or am I being unfair there, Mark? Um, I'm not sure you're being unfair. Um, I mean, as you know, um, being an observer on the board, uh, we've been discussing this and coming up with action plans at board level 
for quite a while. Um, uh, and I'd like to separate slight, very quickly out bus and ferry. Um, bus, for example, um, we had to build into this year's financial budget and indeed towards the end of last year's financial budget to increase um, to, to provide more subsidy, unfortunately, and to increase bus driver wages. Bus driver wage increases is a good thing, um, but we had to do it through government and through council. So um, around middle of last year, um, third quarter of last year, there was two increases in bus driver salaries, which had to be planned well in advance and built into our budgets. Um, the third increase in bus driver salaries, which is being fully funded by um, government through Waka Kotahi, that um, I believe is happening in April. Um, and so again, that has taken six months through at least, if not nine months, through central government to, to get that um, progressed. So certainly um, we haven't been sleeping at the wheel, I don't believe. It's been um, an extensive issue. Um, with ferry is different um, though. Ferry requires um, more high skilled and there's a very close-knit community um, industry, if you like, within New Zealand. As soon as you increase um, salaries and things like that, it has a knock-on effect to the rest of the industry, and Fullers has seen that. Um, uh, so they have been losing people as they've been increasing some salaries as well. So that's where we've been pushing with your support and Council Hill's support um, with the government to change the immigration settings, particularly for um, crew. I think we need to push again on that, um, and, and we've seen some good um, results through Fuller's with the 10 um, they've identified, but I think we need to push again through that as the median wage has increased or is increasing in February. Okay, okay. Councillor yeah. Darby. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I'm sure Councillor there's a lot of questions. Sorry? Councillor Hills, have you got a question on uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just, yeah, once again, thanks that those figures you have up there are quite different to the agenda. So it, it, it is definitely another 10, because that's significant movement from December. It's the, on the, short, the shortfall in ferry. Is it 36 and It's 36. No, okay. the last, last two weeks have been reported um, by followers as 36. Okay. Right? Well, that's, 45 that's in the report, that was a pre Christmas. Thing. Okay, that's a big move. And the, that 100, and, oh, well, I'll just talk in ferries. Um, I guess, and as you know, um, Councillor Darby and I, I think I've seen, um, been on to this before the August lockdown in 2021, um, the frustrations For me, as I think Councillor Walker said, you know, the changes don't flow through if there could be an audit done every time, if there's timetable time table changes, because Fuller's, us, PDFs, and the on wharf information sometimes is three or four different things. I know it's not possible all the time, but that's what people start getting. They can understand the staffing, but it's when it, a domino effects to not being able to understand. And Stephen was sending out fantastic, very detailed information, and Richard has last year, that made us understand. But I guess the community um, would be happier. And also about the communication is the port issue. I know that that was not in the plan the other day when a fuel uh, boat came in late, but how can we get... And uh, Roger has messaged me, so I need to catch up with him. Communications, I think, is, is yeah. what we're talking about. What are you going to do about communications with the Furies? Thank you. Well, as I just touched on, um, you should now have in your inbox, as of last week, a weekly email which provides more detail around um, the different modes of public transport and what's happening, what we're doing. If you need anything more, Richard is the guy who 
um, pulls that together. Um, but yeah, we will certainly try and provide even more information, obviously, to the front line. The issue we've had in the last few weeks, which is why we moved more, particularly on Gulf Harbour, to um, uh, temporarily permanent um, bus replacements, is because the frequency of disruptions was becoming so quick. Fullers was trying to get a, a bus, and we weren't being told until quite late in the day, minutes before departures, what was going on. So. We've tried to actually provide some more certainty back by perhaps taking um, more onerous options of just providing bus services. But um, we've, we have done an audit internally, particularly around changes and disruptions around ferries, and that we should see um, an improvement in communications happening. With regards to the um, event in the um, ferry basin last week, um, that was in breach of the Harbour Master's direction. Um, the Harbour Master has admonished the, the skipper of that, um, I think it was a fueling tug, yeah, um, and that has been addressed, so at least with that skipper, it shouldn't happen again. Uh, so we do have rules around access of commercial vessels into the ferry pattern. Um, for example, on weekdays between 6.30 and, and 9.05 in the morning and 4.30 and 6.05 in the evening, there is um, uh, commercial vessels are not meant to access uh, that part of the harbour and um, under the direction of the harbour master. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hills. Just a final question, I think, myself on ferries to round off this, but then we can get to the other councils. I just really want to uh, question that notion that um, uh, semi permanent uh, bus replacement is somehow indeed a, a, a replacement for a ferry service at a place like Gulf Harbour where there is a a marina that is quite distinct from any bus routes, where there's already a good park and ride. If people want to catch a, a bus, they'll go to the Silverdale Park and Ride. They won't go and detour down to Gulf Harbour Marina and, and take a bus service that takes 50% longer, at least, to get in there. So I'm really curious to know what is the effect on patronage and public confidence where the bus replacement is being advocated as a as a uh, a means for coping with this chronic unreliability, because we had a presentation from the Gulf Harbour Ferry Users Group today, a thousand people, which showed that 37, 45 percent of services are being uh, either uh, cancelled or replaced. So their contention would be that is not a satisfactory replacement, and that, in fact, if anything, it will contribute further to the decimation of what was once um, a thriving uh, commute where people actually located to that suburb because of the ferry service. Yeah, sorry, Chair, I should clarify that that temporary um, full bus replacement was for the period following the storm as we were recovered um, because vessels were going at a sh um, slower speed to avoid any debris in the harbour, which was putting even more pressure onto the schedules. And so I didn't mean that that was going to be an ongoing um, arrangement. I, I, I accept that point, Mark. I guess my final follow-up question to that was that there was a big, as Derek referred to, there was a big public meeting up in Gulf Harbour in October, which was very well attended, uh, where very much the same assurances were given, um, where people, uh, to their credit, were, were quite understanding of the, of the crew shortage, but were led to believe that there were going to be, um, at the very least, noticeable improvements in communications and, and in the operation of the service. That is not eventuated. If anything, it is worse now. I don't think I would be misrepresenting any commuter to saying that. Their confidence uh, has declined even further, and, and people are, are making the observation that, you know, the, that uh, there's a suspicion that the, the service is being run down as a prelude to, to closing it. it. It has reached that bad. So I don't think that level of concern or anxiety has been transferred through this report. It may well be other services um, are functioning reasonably, and I know that is the case with, with some of the other providers in, um, in West Harbour and Hobsonville and elsewhere. But I would say that with the fuller services in particular, there is a, a crisis of confidence in the way those services are being run, and that as we stand, we run the very real risk of uh, 
irreparable damage being done to the ferry mode of transportation in Auckland. And I, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn in respect of a number of my colleagues that I've spoken to around the table. Thank you, Chair. And look, um, we are taking it absolutely seriously. Um, if we need more urgency around the communications and everything else, we will certainly look at that. There's absolutely no intention whatsoever, even if that's the um, perception coming across in the community, and we will need to work with the local councillors to fix that um, about running down the service. I can absolutely assure you of that. It's all about working with fullers to get their staffing levels up again. Um, as you know, um, we purchased four vessels last year off fullers because they could not afford to um, refurbish them to try and get the existing diesel fleet back up to um, fit for purpose, and that will help us as well. But we need to work through that. What we obviously need to do is make sure that we're not be seen perception to be running down Gulf Harbour as the last priority on the ferry list, which is not. Okay, I think we, are. we will move to uh, other parts of the presentation now for finish with ferries. Councillor Lee. Quick question. And I have, when my ferry is cancelled, I, I have no alternative. Um, can, can, can I ask, is in AT's investigations of the staff situation in Fuller's, um, does AT know the average wage of a deckhand, for instance? Uh, through Mr Chair, yes, Councillor, yes, we do have this information now. I don't have it at hand, but we do have this information as of the last few days. And could you advise us of that? I don't have the information at hand, but I can certainly provide that information later. I think it's quite important, and, and it may be part of, may help solve the mystery why we have, you know, at this stage the biggest population in our history, but we're suddenly short of of staff on, on ferries. Um, a few years ago, we had two ferries, com, ferry services competing on half-hour schedules, and yet suddenly um, there was a shortage. I, I would, like bus drivers, I would say that the poor wages that are paid in the industry have a lot to do with this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Lee. Uh, we'll have a, an opportunity to uh, briefly speak to this matter latest, but I, I do want to go on to the other councillors who did have other questions. Councillor Williamson, um, Councillor Ferry, Newman and Henderson had, had questions. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Can I ask you to just put up what I think is called slide 16? It's the third to last slide and headed up PT development plans for 2023. Yeah, I, I looked at that last night over on the right hand side and I thought I just need to go to the optician because I could not even read part of what that graph says. And even when I zoomed in, it was so pixelated, the words are unreadable. And there's an old motto, if you can't put a presentation up that's readable, then it's best not to put it on there. And so I just could not tell. I, you know, it's so blurry. And on the presentation I've got here on my computer, I've just shown it to colleagues on either side. Neither of them can read it either. And it's just not helpful. Anyway, my big question is to go back to something I raised with you last time you were here. And that is to do with buses and bus load factors. I'll repeat that. Load factors. I've got a nominally good uh, Excel spreadsheet that I was able to download from your website which has things like boardings and boardings per service hour and punctuality and reliability. And it's got hundreds of thousands of records in it by day, etc., etc. But that's not what I raised with you last time. That's half of what I raised. If I go back to the airline industry, just so that the clarity is for members, they use two things, available seat kilometres and revenue passenger kilometres. An available seat kilometre is how many empty seats are there, or sorry, how many seats are there, times the kilometres it moves. Because if a plane flies from Auckland to Wellington full and another plane flies from Auckland to Los Angeles completely empty, the average load factor isn't 50%. It's only about 5% because the big long distance had nothing and the short distance was full. 
And what I asked you last time and you agreed you would give to me, which you haven't given me anything, I downloaded this from your website, was some data about revenue passenger kilometres, that is boardings, uh, because you can then work out how many, because if a person gets on at one stop and off at the very next stop, that's hardly uh, a comparable to someone who got on up in Rodney and travelled all the way down to, to Franklin because they've travelled a huge distance and paid a lot of money. So a revenue passenger kilometres would be big. Someone who just went from Brown Street to Smith Street over one stop is almost nothing. And what I'd like to do is, and again, repeat, if I could get that data and any other committee members get it, that is by day of week, by time of day, uh, passengers are travelling in distances by when they got on when they got off, and what the uh, seats were available on that route. Because the dilemma I have is if we're going to get a really good debate going about contestability of modes, yeah. where the money should be going to the Reeves Road flyover or the dedicated busway, then one of the really valuable pieces of information we need to know is how many people are using that? What is the load factor? Now, I've done a couple of experiments. They are only anecdotal, but about seven or eight days ago in the weather when it was fine, I went down and sat on the one kilometre we've got. We've got one kilometre of dedicated busway. We've got one kilometre. So I went and sat down there and had my lunch. And I counted the number of people on each bus as they pulled in and went out. And I also watched the cycleway behind me. Most beautiful cycleway I've ever seen. It's just stunning. If you want to see a beautiful cycleway, go and look at that one kilometre from the Pamua Bridge. Not one cyclist drove past me the entire time I sat there. And every bus had either two or three and sometimes one on them. And so if we're going to have a really good debate about whether you should be building the Reeves Road flyover for the cars that are locked, blocked and stopped, or you should be building, then I think that that information I requested last time and never got is vital that we get it. Now, I don't mind how much you drown us with. In fact, it makes me excited at the thought that you will drown me with too much because I can process it and then decide what your load factors are. I really look forward to getting it. Um, through you, Chair, you're right. We did um, commit to providing you with more um, granular data, um, particularly around the routes um, that you're talking about. Um, so we will set up, a, call out to your office, set up a meeting so we can drill down into that data and you can have the spreadsheet as well, absolutely. Um, we do have that information and we don't report it, um, but certainly we can look at that through how we can report that by route. What we do rep report by route, um, obviously, is boardings, patronage, um, kilometres travel and everything else. Um, but we don't necessarily report exactly the KPIs you've provided there, but we can do. Um, certainly in terms of um, expenditure on bus ways and Cycleways, um, obviously, um, under the previous, under the current RLTP, under the current um, long-term plan, we are building multimodal corridors, um, which include those aspects. And I guess that's an ongoing um, conversation moving forward, which we want to have around what are we doing in these multimodal corridors. Um, certainly, retro flyover is happening. Um, and if you haven't had a briefing on that, then... And when we arrange to go into the data, we can provide you with an overview of the Reeve Road Slider as well, which is the, first, is the next stage of the Eastern Bus Work. Quickly on that. When your chairman in 2015 announced they were canning the Reeves Road flyover for at least a decade, there was an explosion in the constituency, like you wouldn't believe, public meetings baying for blood. Then Lester Levy two months later came out and said, oh, that was a mistake. We didn't mean that we were canning it for a decade. Not correct. Well, if you take 2015 and you add 10 years to it, I think it's going to happen at any rate, even though they said we didn't mean it to be a decade. OK. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Williamson. So I think we had our Councillor Fury and Councillor Henderson. Thank and you. Uh, I'll endeavour to um, keep it brief. The, um, just going back to the buses, the driver shortage... And I'm just really struggling with a few things in the um, agenda report. Some of them are, the numbers are a bit different in what we've been presented today and generally in the positive direction, which is good. Um, that seemed to me to not quite add up. You know, I'm quite concerned that the way we're doing this network recast is sort of locking in 
um, an approach that says the driver shortage is going to continue. Uh, it was really heartened to hear the um, the you know, 111 more and, and so on, and now under 300 for the first time. And particularly heartened to hear how Akin Eastern had no vacancies because um, my recollection from past stats was that how Akin Eastern and NZ Bus were the two um, contractors who had the, the biggest issue. So you didn't mention NZ Bus. Um, that's the one that is the main uh, contractor in my ward. Um, and I'm also aware that through the recast, um, despite the fact that the, the report told us that the um, bounce back to pre-COVID levels was going better in Central and West, um, it's actually a number of um, Central and West services that are being um, cut during the recast, acknowledging the intention is to reinstate those, but there's no timeframes given around that. Um, the 27T, which I'm not a huge fan of, actually I'd rather have more Ws and Hs, but... Um, I didn't want them to happen at the cost of 20 T services um, in the evening peak each day. So um, what's sort of your thinking in that space around how are we helping NZ Bus in particular? Um, are we effectively baking in? Um, the finances say that you're expecting 69% uh, of pre-COVID levels to the end of June for this financial year, which has financial implications in terms of fare box revenue. Um, but you're telling us that we're now at 75% of pre-COVID level with still, um, I imagine, about half of the financial year to go. So can you marry those up for me, please? Thank you. Uh, certainly. I think the, the starting point on recast is that we modelled the recast based on a 90% patronage recovery. So the fact that we we're at 73% last week, we're, on, we're still within that threshold. Um, and the intent of recast was to repurpose where we are able to reduce service at peak hours. So the, as a user of the 27s myself, yes, I've noticed that the 27T is, is coming out. Uh, will I be able to get an H and a W? Yes, I'm confident that I will be able to get home from work and will be able to get in in the morning. Derek will be pleased to hear. So there are other services nearby. Of course, Manukau Road is well served. Dominion Road is well served. We expect some people will choose to divert to those services, but we still think there's going to be enough capacity on the Mount Eden Road corridor because we are aiming, we are um, modelling based on the 90% recovery. It didn't really answer the finance question, though, in terms of you've got uh, in the report uh, financial implications that you're working towards a 69% recovery um, for the fare box revenue, whereas we're already operating at higher than that. I'll see um, if I can find the agenda page. Yeah, uh, I think what you're referring to is um, at the moment our SOI and therefore our budget is built around for this financial year 59 million and target. We're currently tracking ahead of that, so that's good news from a, a revenue point of view. And next year um, we are targeting, or we were targeting, we will need to re um, confirm it through the SOI process, 85 million patronage. Um, and uh, as an internal stretch target, we have identified by uh, end of June this year, we wish to be tracking at a run rate to achieve that 85 million before we enter next financial year. Um, so our budgets are based around that. So there's no baking in of any um, lower level of service from that perspective. Thank you, Councillor Fury. Uh, Councillor Henderson. Thank you. Mine was in a very similar vein to Councillor Fury's, actually. Um, We've got some companies that seem to be succeeding at recruiting drivers much better than others. Uh, I'm worried that we're recasting a network based on driver shortages where we're relying on private companies to recruit or not recruit. So do you have any kind of thoughts on uh, why some seem to succeed more than others? Um, yeah, that's probably my question. Thanks. This is Derek Copa, Councillor Henderson. Um, so the recast is mainly driven by the changes in the travel uh, patterns post-COVID. And the process started well before the identified longer term shortage was actually hitting us um, in terms of reliability. The process started as part of a working group set up with the operators, Waka Kotaki and Council of Trade Unions. And it was intended to reduce the split shifts, which are driven by higher peak, higher number of peak services. It, it did coincide with the shortage, and which means that when we're implementing those changes, there will be some reduction in peak vehicle requirements. Therefore, number of peak shifts for drivers 
will reduce. However, some other services will be operated longer in the evenings or into peak to provide more travel choices for those other people that may choose not to travel elsewhere in the peak, but travel at different times of the day. Um, the, oh, we're working very closely with all operators and we have a weekly uh, reports and weekly conversations on their progress in recruitment. Some are smaller companies and their requirements are easier met. Um, Harrogate East and Pavlovich are examples of those smaller operators who can meet their requirements quicker because they have to re re uh, recruit lower numbers. Larger operators like uh, NZ Bus and Riches, for example, they need larger numbers to recruit, and they are currently ac actively recruiting from overseas. Um, overall, uh, up to 250 drivers were signed up and recruited in various jurisdictions overseas. Many of them are now processed, being processed through the immigration uh, service and New Zealand police to be here and trained. So we will see a greater improvement from those large operators where they have recruited uh, drivers overseas, and they are allocated a number of tokens, so-called tokens, from the immigration service to process those drivers. So this will take a little bit longer, as they need to, as a created employer, they need to provide housing, uh, appropriate living conditions and training. So this will take a little bit longer, but we're reasonably confident, as you, can, you saw with these weekly updates, we are on the right track to, to improve the situation over the next few months. Thank, Thank you. you. And I do commend the weekly updates, by the way. They're fantastic. Thanks, Chair. Thanks. Councillor Newman. Yes, hello. I've got a question regarding this and one about fair review. Um, Tahuia. So can I understand with respect to Tahuia, is that, that's a freight service, is that throughout the year, is that going to be running all the way through to the Strand um, or is it um, concluding somewhere? I mean, does that get through the network and how far does that get through the network? Um, it's uh, an interregional passenger service, which um, is, as far as I'm aware, from Kiwi Rail and terminating and originating at the Strand. Okay. So um, I understood from the correspondence um, several weeks ago that um, the discussion that was taking place um, with Kiwi Rail, which is the operator for Tahiria for services, uh, to allow for uh, Patri um, customers to to board at Papakura um, for, to, to use that service between Papakura and Pūnui or Otahu, why wouldn't we assume that the passengers may, some passengers may choose or want to um, access this, the, the service at Papakura and get as far as they can go on it? Um, as far as we're aware, they can um, use it, um, boarding at Papa, um, Papakura. Um, but I don't know what the capacity or the arrangements are with QRL um, and what the spare capacity is on that service, to be honest, um, but I can um, inquire for you. Okay, and are they able to travel using AT Hop or do they have to buy a separate ticket um, at public? I mean, understanding that it's uh, obviously it's a completely different service used outside of the Auckland network, but it nevertheless provides some amenity, some capacity for people who might be otherwise disrupted um, by um, services not running um, on that southern line. Um, uh, through the Chair, uh, Councillor Newman, Daruk here. So um, there are no limitations for customers to use the Huya, and they can enter and board the, the platform using Hopcard. Um, I will need to follow up with are there any restrictions that um, Kira may put on passengers boarding at Papakura without a, another ticket purchased through their uh, agents or their, um, their website. Um, but there are no physical or, uh, limitations from my perspective for those customers to use their train. I will follow up on the technicality, what happens if they are on board and come back to you. Okay, then they can come to me offline. Chair, I had a question regarding the fear review as well. Okay, do you, you want to ask that now? Yeah, look, I, I just, I've been making notes here and, and reading the presentation. So you referred to um, that the fear review has taken place, that there is a plan to increase the fears, but um, because of various matters, um, it's been decided that this will take place later in the year. Well, what does later in the year mean? Has this been an agreement from the board 
that this will be later in the year and can we get some clarification as to when this one's going to drop on us? Um, it was uh, meant to be implemented in February. Um, obviously, for obvious reasons, we've chosen to defer that. Um, we haven't um, communicated yet to the board and we haven't asked the board yet for a um, an implementation date, um, but certainly as part of that process, we will need to engage with yourselves. Um, it, it is part of, at the moment of the proposed budget for next year, um, and there was an element of revenue which we were, were requiring for this financial year. So probably the best I could say at the moment is it would be later in the year, but possibly towards the middle of the year. But we will need to confirm back. So one would expect, say, 1 July, the next financial year? And we need to also align it to what's actually going to happen long term on half price fares and discounts from the government and everything else as well. Okay, uh, thank you. D did you want to ask a question, Councillor Hills? Because we'll make this the last one, then I'll have to move uh, an extension of time and, and hopefully go to a fairly uh, limited uh, discussion on this or debate. Um, but we'll just start with that. that qu I'll, I'll move the extension of time now. Okay, do I have a seconder? Councillor Newman, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Uh, Carrie, Aye. Aye. Thank you, Chair. Um, just on the buses more in, in general, and obviously great to have the 111, that's amazing, because um, it was going the wrong way at December. Um, the, are you and do you think you're ready for March Madness? And discussions last year around the rail closures, I asked about pop-up bus lanes and different ways to do prioritisation of routes around there to get the um, rail replacement buses turned over quicker. Is that happening? Has that happened? Um, I'm just seeing massive numbers on the busway and on my bus uh, that, that are far ahead of where they usually are in February, so I'm worried that we're not ready or, or, or we're not warning people to spread the peak um, when, when, when students come back in two weeks. Um, yeah, I'm March Madness, uh, so we have been able to cope at 100% of the 2019 levels. We currently have about 8% uh, of services suspended because of the driver shortage, and we are having to cancel around another 10% reactively, so that's 18% down. We're currently at 70 73%, so we're still within range. Um, even in 2019, during March Madness, it was certain times a day and it was certain trips that were getting very highly utilised. It certainly wasn't the whole network. There was still extra capacity across the whole network. And that's where the, you're right, that messaging around spreading the peak where possible, that's very important. That's messaging that we've put out through COVID and through the driver shortage saying that where we are restricted, it may be helpful to look at alternative times to travel or alternative ways to travel and those options around there. So I think we can keep that messaging going. Um, let you, I'll take the second part of the question. So the, we have investigated a number of bus priority measures to support the rail replacement buses. Um, it is a complex matter because many of those bus priorities require consultations and when assessing impact on other road users, they were not delivering overall benefits to all road users, uh, particularly where the infrastructure is narrow and the roads are not appropriate. However, we have delivered, um, extended a lot more bus priority along Great South Road that's now in place and that will be supporting stage one and stage two of the rail network closure. And we are working with the Walker Kotaki project to provide um, additional bus, pri uh, bus, bus priority improvements along the Northwestern busway, which will provide additional uh, travel options um, when the Western line will close in stage five later in 2025. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mark and team, for a very uh, comprehensive briefing today covering both the, um, you know, the, the, the PT and, and the, the storm event crisis. We, we really appreciate the, the quality of reporting that we're getting here. If you wouldn't mind, gentlemen, that's the, <laughs> the questioning, the Spanish Inquisition uh, stage of proceedings finished. We will now bring some... Um, recommendations up with regard to this item. So if it, you could perhaps uh, go back behind the barricades there, you'll, you. you'll be safe. Um, I, I don't anticipate this taking uh, t too long, uh, councillors, but I just wanted to make a couple of uh, a brief points just to uh, explain, explain my seeking. So I'll, I'll move this and I'll, I'll look for a seconder. Um, just uh, thank you, Councillor Lee. Um, and it 
Uh, so I'll just very quickly speak to it. Um, I don't think it's too contentious and it reflects what we've heard today. Uh, just received the report and the relevant actions in the first instance. Uh, note the committee's concerns with regards to uh, Fuller's ability to maintain a reliable ferry service and to communicate effectively with ferry users. And C, um, it requests the Transport and Infrastructure Committee work with Auckland Transport to clearly identify and seek solutions to the ongoing deficiency in ferry services across Auckland and report back to the March meeting of the committee. Now, I'll just explain the rationale of that. I have spoken to a number of uh, colleagues uh, who are very familiar with their own wards with the, with the performance of the ferry services, uh, and I really appreciate the, the feedback I've got there. I and uh, Councillor Walker have got a reasonable understanding of Gulf Harbour. I know Councillor Hills and Councillor Darby are you know, uh, very well versed in, in Devonport and the, and the Birkenhead um, Bay's water services, similarly with Councillor Lee with, uh, with Waiheke. And um, th there is an issue here. Uh, Councillor Darby made the good point, I thought, in his questioning that uh, Auckland Transport, more than anyone um, over the years, has, has made a, a, a wonderful effort in growing the ferry services across Auckland. I think of the service of what um, Gulf Harbour had in 2010 to what it had in 2019 was a, a very uh, uh, strong improvement both in the, the number of sailings and the quality of craft. Um, and that, that was something that really um, flipped a lot of people to commuting by ferry uh, up on the Hibiscus Coast and, in fact, uh, encouraged a number of people to live up there for that very reason. Since that time, however, the same cannot be said. Um, and that we, we know we have a crisis in public transport for a variety of reasons. We have a crisis within a crisis, in my view, in respect of the performance of the, of the ferry service. Um, and I don't think um, that the, the kind of the, the public face of what that mean uh, has really uh, been fully expressed. If you go to some of the, the comments, and certainly the councillors out in the wards know what people are saying, um, but the true extent to which that's impacting upon what are a very loyal, cohesive group of commuter, commuters is very disturbing. So I'll, I'll just I'll just finish uh, by really just trying to give some sort of voice to the people out there, the people of public that, that travel by the ferry. This is one uh, little testimony. It could have been any number of other ones as far as the Gulf Harbour service goes. So this is, a, this is indicative. Uh, other people have uh, a similar uh, experience almost on a daily basis from a, um, a young lady uh, who worked in the city, and I'll just take a, about a minute. I wish to discuss how the services ran, or rather didn't run this morning. After the 7am Gulf Harbour to Auckland was cancelled with no alternative options provided, many opted to take later services, including the 8.30 Gulf Harbour to Auckland that I also planned to take. At 7.16, a prompt notification came through on the app advising that due to break, a breakdown, the service wouldn't be operated and taxis would be provided for patrons wishing to take the 8.30 service. If the taxis had been booked when it was advised, there would have been uh, an hour and a quarter for taxis to get up to Gulf Harbour Marina. They didn't, and it was ultimately at 9.15 that I left after waiting for over 45 minutes, two hours after the prompt suggesting taxi had been arranged. I was standing with a couple who had international flights to catch, a mother with a baby who was left to call family for help since she wouldn't be able to take the taxi if it, didn't have a, if it had a car seat, a young woman who had a shift in town she was unable to get cover for, um, uh, and many other people who were frantically looking at their watches and pacing for their own reasons. I myself had a meeting in town with my CO and operations rep, uh, which I, I, I wasn't able to make. As I talked to another man, I found the situation was far from uncommon. Uh, um, one person described how he'd been subject to disciplinary hearing about continuous issues with his compute commute, turning up late for work. As he was standing there, a man took it upon himself to call AT about this issue and was told that it was uh, not their responsibility and he needed to contact Fuller's. Um, it seems there's a loop situation where Fuller's doesn't want to accept responsibility for, frankly, what is an unacceptable service, and AT uh, 
keep pinballing patrons back and forwards between the service providers, and we're left quite literally twiddling our thumbs and stranded. I don't know what to expect from sending this email, but if I'm honest, it's simply not something that should be dismissed with a shrug, as there are many people affected by this, not just this morning, but every day. We are not a suburb close enough to town that we can just grab an Uber if the promised alternative transport doesn't arrive. For many, this is our only option, and it's not reliable anymore. What happened? I used to take the ferry every single day without issue, morning and night, and the amount of cancellations and drop balls when it comes to alternatives is staggering and disheartening, seeing as I was such a champion for this service and talked it up for years. So that probably captures a lot of the people on Gulf Harbour. I hope this resolution allows the expertise around this table um, to work with our, you know, our good friends and officers in uh, AT who have done so much work over the years to build up our ferry services to make sure that we do not lose these patrons in the interim. Thank you. Councillor Hills. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your um, work on this and your um, strong contribution then. I, I, yeah, I am disappointed with this because I have always been such a, a, a big promoter, celebrator, defender of AT and everything public transport. I do understand the massive um, worker issues and issues with COVID and, and all that. But I guess when I sent emails and asked for plans back in August 2021, there was a lockdown a couple of weeks later, um, but around my concerns back then around what is the plan? Should we get the minister here? Is it being treated as a crisis? What are we doing about this? Because we can all see um, when we get the abuse, um, people ringing us up and swearing at us, the, the comments and the, the tags on Facebook, um, every single day because these issues are, are popping up. I, um, I'm a public transport user and I'm proud to be, and a lot of people are too, but if people's lives are, are affected so often at the moment, then they feel like they have no option. The Kiwi Rail um, situation with the closure of the rail came as a surprise, um, but it's an, an important investment, $330 million. We're never going to say no to that, but I still feel like we've stop short? Have we asked for everything? Have we asked the government to subsidise public transport during that time, during off-peak? Have we asked them for help with emergency um, uh, processes to put up bus, bus lanes? Um, are we doing everything we can to make sure people don't turn away from public transport um, forever? So I, I just guess I'm frustrated. There's, there's a lot of work that's happened in the last few months that that's getting there, but people are totally exhausted um, with the process. And often it is just about how we communicate it better. If people understand what it actually is, operational issues, people just get annoyed with that. If it said, sorry, there's a breakdown and, and we'll send out the uh, examples to you, or there's someone at the at the bus stop or at the ferries more often to explain these issues, then people feel like there's a plan. Um, the, the issues that the community come to us about is it doesn't feel like an international city at the moment. It doesn't feel like a city that functions. And that, that is, there is a myriad of issues there. I just hope that now we're seeing, you know, we're up nearly 80%, probably the storms delayed that a little bit. Um, we are heading back in the right direction, so we do need to invest drastically. But the other thing is, I also have no confidence in the fact that the areas where we don't need drivers and don't need um, money is walking and cycling. There are a number of projects that keep getting delayed, keep getting cancelled, keep getting politicised that could be happening in the city that give people the options to travel without money, without bus drivers, without ferry um, crew, that in the next couple of years, kids, parents, whoever, could be walking and cycling to school and those projects keep getting pushed out and pushed out. So for me, it feels like the dominoes are falling down and we need to try and all work together to pick them up. So I'm trying to be nice. I've always been def defensive when the good things have happened because so much has happened in the last decade that has been fantastic, led by Auckland Transport. But we need to quickly fix these issues and explain to Aucklanders when it's going to be turned around. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Councillor Hills. It's been moved. It's uh, been seconded. Um, I'll put it to the vote. All those in favour? Aye. Against? Aye. Carried. Thank you, um, councillors, for that. So we go to the penultimate um, item.
uh, on the agenda today, and the last one is just an information one, so that finishing line is, is in sight, believe it or not, folks. So uh, this one is item 12. 12. Um, it is to do with the Auckland Integrated Transport uh, Plan being progressed by uh, Mayor Brown and the Minister of Transport. Um, Mayor Brown, I, I understand you're going to um, introduce this item and speak to the paper. I am, thank you. I've been punished severely by me, made number 11, 12. <laughs> but, but I've accepted my punishment. As Nicole this morning from Waka Kotahi said, there are lots of players in the transport, Auckland Transport Network um, scene. Um, Ministry of Transport, Treasury, Waka Kotahi, it goes on. And lots of plans have been prepared, but no overall plan. There are people, do. and so the lack of existence of the Auckland Integrated Transport Plan is what has brought this paper about. This will inform the debate about light rail, the harbour crossing, port, the um, coastal shipping, and a whole other bunch of things as well as public transport. As a result of this, both myself and the Minister of Transport have agreed on the need for a broader plan to future-proof Auckland with a high-quality joined-up transport system which more closely integrates decision-making on cars, buses, trains, ferries, cyclists, pedestrians, freight, passenger rail, light rail, the port and coastal shipping, which also should have been written in there. This includes considering steps to address immediate and pressing leads as well as long-term city shaping initiatives. The scope has been confirmed by a negotiation between the Mayor, my staff and the Minister staff to meet both of our priorities. In summary, the transport plan directs on work on four movements. The long-term strategic integrated view of transport needs in Auckland. To pre present an integrated network showing how all transport modes will work together, including freight which seems to have been forgotten a bit, provide commentary on the implications of consolidating and moving the Auckland port, details of a three to ten year capital programme. The process of developing the plan will involve myself and the Minister jointly providing direction at key points along the way, and I propose setting up a political reference group comprising of relevant councillors that I can consult directly with in advance of these meetings between myself and the Minister, who will also have his group. The plan needs to be agreed by May to meet government timeframes, so the process must be nimble. Especially you've noted that other groups are rushing out to consultation without realising really whether they actually have a part in the long-term plan. However, I expect the plan will be workshopped with councillors where possible. I'll take on board what I've heard from all councillors and I expect other councillors on the political reference group to do the same thing. Uh, and you have had with you the paper, which I believe answers most of the questions. So um, if there's any... Megan is uh, going to be the... Megan is going to be the council representative to speak to this, who I'll be working closely with. Yeah. So thank you, uh, Mr Mayor. Uh, um, Megan has uh, joined the table to ask her any uh, questions with respect of uh, this item from an officer point of view. Uh, Councillor Walker, you appear to be the only person asking a question. Well, I mean, I've, I've just got a quick question. It goes to the presentation earlier on today where there was a plan uh, presented, which was the 2012 to 2042 um, Auckland plan, including a strategic transport network. And I refer you also to the Sir Dove Meyer Robinson plan <laughs> that was remarkably similar to uh, this that was developed, if I recall, back in the 1970s. So it is not as though we have not had a plan and not had a plan that was actually capable of being um, delivered. I would suggest that within the scope, absolutely, there needs to be prioritisation. So I have a question as to whether that is implicit within the, within the scope. 
because you can have a plan as big as Ben Hur, but we need to get on with finishing the stuff that we've already started. Thank you. I hear that loud and clear. Uh, there have been other plans. It's one thing Auckland is capable of is producing plans. Uh, implementing them, we've fallen short. Um, and the plans have never quite cover, covered everything, including freight, the port, coastal shipping, heavy rail. Uh, it was one of the few countries in the world that didn't build heavy rail in the last 15 years for some reason. Um, and we, we tend to have had plans dominated by somebody suddenly thinking, oh, we need a bridge or suddenly we need something new light rail or suddenly we need something else. The, the plans have been driven by politics rather than practicalities. And so this, this is going to have a crack at And we will utilise all of those excellent plans from the past. So we'll just put them in a mixer. OK, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, we have uh, a couple more questions, Councillor Darby and Dalton. Councillor Darby. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Mayor. Yeah, look, I, I have to admit I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit confused as to what the integrated transport plan is because, I mean, I'm also aware we've got a raft of plans um, that then – and they, they sit under a construct of a planning framework – and then that helps inform your regional land transport plan. And that's where you specify, you know, your your objectives and your your delivery. So I, as we unpack this, I, I'm going to be really intrigued as to what actually is missing, because there's mention of not addressing freight, but there is, a, of course, a freight plan um, that sits there. There's cycling plans, there's asset management plans, as arterial road plans, and the list goes on and on. And they all contribute to that overarching planning framework. And I'm I'm intrigued by sort of what the, what the nub of the problem is, um, rather than saying there isn't an integrated plan. But, but look, we, we need to get there. Mayor, I'm also intrigued by the scope. The scope has been signed off by you and the the minister. Has the minister had it signed off by cabinet? Do we do we know whether he's had it signed off by cabinet or is it not something that needs to go to cabinet? Because it doesn't have a sign off by Auckland Council by us. We're just noting it today. So, is there not an expectation that we should be looking at the scope together, which we haven't done, um, and then collectively signing it off, which is what you do with ATAP and everything else. Question for you there, Mayor. This is kind of like ATAP plus, actually. ATAP was heading in that direction some years ago, but it kind of stalled somewhere. In terms of, uh, I don't know whether the minister had it to the cabinet, but the minister and I have agreed we'll get on with this. Whatever comes out of it, will have to go to both the governing body and the cabinet. But at the moment, in order to get on with things, part of it is, is there is a rush to do other things. There is a rush to finish. To, to, we've got people working on a harbour crossing. We've got people working on light rail. None of those things have been done in conjunction with everything else. It's a bit like the cycleway the plan. We've got a lot of plans, and this is... We're not rewriting them. We're trying to bring them together and put them into an order. The ATAP used to be able to do that, is to give some priority to, um, in a planned way, to expenditure on transport. But um, it's been hurdled by politics. And I think there has been a very loud cry from the public that Auckland wants to have a bit more say in what goes into Auckland rather than Wellington. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Both, both the additional harbour crossing and the Auckland Light Rail project are mentioned in the Auckland um, ATAP, and they're, they're both mentioned in the Regional Land Transport Plan as well. Um, Megan, are you on the call? Um, are you on this call? A question for the Chief of Strategy, if, if she's available, Chair? Yes, she's there. Uh, thank you. Megan, what's the involvement of um, – I, I can see mention of Auckland Transport being involved to date – What's the involvement at, to date and likely involvement in the future of our transport strategy unit within council? 
through the chair, Kia ora, Councillor Darby. Um, yes, look, we're all involved, so all the ATAP parties are, so including Auckland Council um, and our transport strategy team. At this stage, of course, the scope has been done, as the Mayor has said, through the offices of the Mayor and the Minister. We're now working together in order to provide some information to the first meeting of the Mayor and Minister in a couple of weeks' time. And we're doing that across all the ATAP partners, Wakotahi, Ministry of Transport, Auckland Transport and Auckland Council. So are you confirming that the Transport Strategy Unit has not informed the scope? I'm just saying that the scope is, was developed through the offices of the Mayor and the Minister. OK, you're diplomatic. Good. <laughs> That's good. OK, um, thank you. OK, Councillor Dolphin. Uh, thank you, Chair Watson. My question relates to the political reference group, and it might be something that we're going to come up against through this term. Um, this is a very important piece of work, and because the majority of chairs and appointments to CCOs and appointments to Auckland Transport Board are men, we are going to be missing gender equity if we look at this particular group here um, with our IMSB and there I think we've got five men to women. So as we go through these important pieces of work, how are we going to ensure that we get a balance? There was a report put out by the Ministry of Transport a couple of years ago talking specifically to the inequity around this piece was specifically around public transport and um, the inequity for women, um, for uh, transgender, from minority groups who weren't getting a voice or getting served. So the importance of having those voices in these direction setting committees that have such an influence on the future of our city. Um, my question is, how do we ensure that we, we keep that balance? So we keep them. Um, I'm only speaking from a woman's perspective. I'm sure there'll be councillors who want to speak from um, a Māori Pacifica perspective as well. Thank you. Perhaps I should call on Megan to answer that, who is definitely a woman. Uh, through the chair, um, Councillor Dalton, uh, that is a, a good point. I think uh, it ultimately does come to the decision on who uh, would be on this political working group. So uh, you have the recommendation in front of you, unless there's a, a decision to change those members. Um, that's what will happen for this particular project. Uh, and again, as, as you're with your colleagues around the table, you will need to make some decisions about how you want to proceed through this term. Um, to try and get a certain level of equity or representation in these kinds of groups. Thank you for thank you for answering that, Megan. I appreciate that. Okay, uh, we've got Councillor Councillor Newman and um, finish with Councillor Hills. Megan, thank you. I come from the perspective of being uh, from my Monterey Pukkara Ward Councillor hat, and I just want to understand. Um, there are some projects that have been very, very long-standing in ATAP, which were then moved to NZ Up, but seem to have died. And I refer, of course, to the, the Mill Road corridor. So I want to understand how does this particular piece of work enable us to get that particular project and potentially other projects which have lost favour because of the reprioritisation under NZ Up back into the plan noting that they may well be priorities for a revised GPS um, next year and that we've got to have a, a something that is sufficiently resilient to withstand whatever happens in October. Through the, I'm happy to help answer that, Mayor Brown, and then if you wanted to add. So I think there's, there's possibly two ways here. The first is at the higher level about the integrated network, as the Mayor has said. And so it could well be projects that um, are part of that, that um, important part of the network that need to be perhaps highlighted or, or re-highlighted through that. The second element then is the, the shorter term three to ten year plan like the ATAP. So that's a funded and committed and prioritised list. And that's another way that those kinds of projects could could be seen and then uh, look to be funded or um, or constructed over that time period. OK, 
Okay, thank you, uh, Megan. Um, Councillor Hills. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I would consider, if the Mayor would consider thinking about adding Councillor Dalton, and I was disappointed to see a councillor laughing at um, Councillor Dalton's question, because um, I think it's quite important what she said. My question to you, Chair, or maybe to Megan, um, is around how climate change will be taken seriously through this. So we've obviously got our own transport emissions reduction plan, the government's emissions reduction plan, and obviously what we've seen over the last three weeks is catastrophic um, climate change, which has happened, but also that we need to be resilient, so both reducing our emissions and adapting to it. Can I assume or be assured that this will be taken as a priority as we had in the last term? Through the, through my understanding is that, that, that we're not questioning that part of it. We're just questioning which of the things fit together in the best way to deliver the actual transport network. The uh, requirement to meet the um, uh, consider the climate changes across all forms of transport and all forms of decision making. But if, for instance, as a decision that the port will move in a certain period of time, that will have an impact right across the district that possibly hasn't been thought of so far. And so it's more about that. There's no intention to reduce uh, the um, focus on the climate. And it's been, we've had a big reminder of that just recently. But it's, it's about considering all of the things which are floating around, not just things that have, have popped up for largely political reasons. Okay. okay. And if anything, I'd rather reduce the numbers of people on the thing rather than increase yeah. it. There's, there's, we, we, that the whole point of having a committee is to have a committee. Um, okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councillor Bartley. Um, thank you, uh, Chair. I was just um, just going to suggest a practical solution for uh, the male domination on the political working party, and that would be to add the Deputy Chair of the Planning, Environment and Parks Committee. Because when I was Deputy Chair of Planning, we had the same issue. It was all men and all our political working groups. And then it was um, just adding me as the deputy to kind of have that gender balance. So that's what I was hoping could be done. It seems an easy solution. And then I also wanted to know where does the TERP, how does the TERP integrate into this Auckland Integrated Transport Plan? I would have thought it was a major component of it. These are my questions. Thank you. Okay. Do you, um, do you want to pick those up, M Megan? Through the chair, have you pick up the TERP one? Uh, so, Councillor Bartley, uh, as the Mayor has said, you know, climate change is one of the, the key elements to consider with Auckland's future transport plan. And so for, for Auckland Council, that includes um, the Transport Emission Reduction Plan and to Tarakia Tafari, our climate plan. We also know the government, of course, has got a government policy statement um, which has just recently come out, and climate is the key focus in that. So again, these are matters that need to be considered by the Mayor and the Minister as to how that is outworked uh, into the future uh, network and into those more short-term, three- to ten-year prioritised lists. Okay, th th thank you, uh, Megan. Is, is that okay, Councillor Bartley? Did that answer your question? Yeah, 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 that's my question, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And then in terms of putting Angela on? Well, I, I, I guess I guess that's that's a matter um, for the Mayor. There is the, the recommendations here. Mr Mayor, do you want to answer that or just leave it to the debate? If, 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 in my view, there's already too many on it, actually. Um, I'd rather reduce the number... The point is that I am meeting the minister one on one with this, and um, and so we're we're trying to. Um, this is not an effort to um, change the gender balance in it. I mean, we've just had a whole lot of men show up for Auckland Transport. That didn't seem to be a problem. Um, so, 
It, well, yeah, I mean, that would strike me that those people are there all the time. This is for one month. Um, perhaps we should look at questioning um, Auckland Transport. Uh, they may or maybe I'll tell you what, I'll put that in as part of the things we're discussing. Why aren't there more women at the top of Auckland Transport? There you go. Um, but I'd like to put the motion, I'd request you put the motion and get on with it. Like okay, so um, the... I, I'll move the recommendation be seconded by the Mayor. It's now open for, for discussion or, or debate. Is there anyone who wants to speak to it? Yeah, just, I oh, will. Um, no one else has put their hand up there. Uh, look, um, just on that question, so Mayor, I'm probably, look, I probably need to express I'm disappointed that you haven't included the de Deputy Chair. For the reasons of gender equity, yes, and they've been well outlined by Councillor Dalton. But we're dealing with transport infrastructure that cannot be dislocated from land use planning. And so we've got Councillor Hills there. Um, Councillor Dalton um, has been leading the future development strategy work, is very, um, um, you know, experienced in the, in the planning area. Um, coming into this, and I think there's a risk that we start to see transport increasingly like it's just about catching train, bus, ferry, car, whatever it is, and not relating it to uh, the land use implications. And this is somewhere where we had, I thought we'd advanced tremendously, but if we go back to just engineering our way out of this challenge, then we will go back to the 60s. Um, and I think that's a real risk. But look, Mayor, um, we've given you the opportunity to include somebody to in, to make sure that there was a bit more thinking uh, around land use and you've declined it, which is really disappointing. Uh, it's not the size. It's definitely not the size. It's actually about the quality of the people you have around that table who can enter that inquiry, test things, um, rebut things, um, you know, challenge, offer, etc. And I think Councillor Dalton would have been um, a tremendous plus at that table. But I, I just totally don't get why that opportunity has been spurned. Okay, thank you, Councillor Darby. Councillor Lee, you, you want to contribute to this? Uh, I, we're not setting up a committee here, I understand. We have quite a few of them. Um, and um, I'm sure the members of all those committees have in some ways a relationship to transport. And so theoretically, we can have all of them on that committee, but then getting everyone in the same room, um, in other words, another governing body, um, doesn't really make sense, or a committee of the whole doesn't make sense. We have a committee of the whole here, the Transport Committee, I understand this working group um, will report um, to the Transport and Infrastructure Committee. So uh, I think we need to keep things in, in proportion here um, if, if, if this thing is going to work. It's, it's, it's a novel approach. Um, it's part of the Mayor's mandate and initiative, and I'm quite happy um, to help if I can. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Councillor Fury. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to express my disappointment that we haven't been able to um, add the Deputy Chair of the Planning, Environment and Parts Committee. I think um, others have outlined really good reasons why she'd be a great addition. I did just want to note that no one is seeking a committee of the whole in this place for the political reference group and um, to characterise adding one person uh, as that is inaccurate. I'd also note that often on political reference groups, um, they are larger and they include representatives from local boards, which is not the case with this one. And I understand why it's not the case, um, but I really, I understand the, the sense that a smaller number is more efficient, um, but in this case, I feel it would be um, losing some real value at the table, making it smaller for no good reason. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ferry. Councillor Walker. Um, I'm more than happy with the, the number of people on it. I wouldn't mind being on it myself. I'm sure any number of us might. I have absolute trust in those people there. 
I'm absolutely confident on the Mayor's part and others that the lines of communication will be open and there will be feedback. Um, I'm sure I'll be listened to and other uh, councillors. Um, I don't doubt that there are expenditure issues that, um, that uh, Morris Williamson might want to take up. Obviously, we've got to fund things. It's going to come back to the governing body. Everybody's on that. For goodness sake, we need to get on with things and we need to reduce the number of people involved with things to make haste. Mm -hmm. There are enough things for us to be involved with. Thank you. OK, thank you, Councillor Walker. It's been moved. It's been seconded. I'll put it to the vote. All those in favour, say aye. 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 Against? Aye. 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 Against? Did, 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 OK. One against. OK, I declared that carried. Thank you. We now move to the uh, last item of the day, which is, thank goodness, is a uh, is, uh, information report uh, moved by Councillor Walker, seconded by Councillor Stewart. Um, any discussion? No, thank you. Uh, all those in favour, say aye. 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 Receiving the report. Aye. Against? Carried. And there is no extraordinary business. Um, I'd just like to uh, conclude by thanking everyone for uh, your assistance today, getting through a, uh, what was a big agenda and a lot of uh, very significant matters, uh, of which we will be sure to be hearing more over the course of 2023. Thank you, and, and have a well-deserved uh, rest, everyone. Especially you, Barry.